Marie hasn't caught a break since she was a kid. Everyone around her thought she was totally useless at everything and labeled her the family disappointment. Even though her mom was the empress, little Marie couldn't get anything right, she couldn't sing, dance, cook, nada. The palace maids gossiped non-stop about her behind her back. Things went from med to worse when Marie's mom passed away unexpectedly. Her dad the emperor took her under his wing but even becoming an official princess didn't give her any fancy new talents overnight. Then their kingdom got conquered by the neighboring empire which is never fun. Marie somehow managed to escape getting killed with the rest of the royals. But now she's stuck playing maid, keeping her true identity on the down low. To top it off, head housekeeper Hilda stays on her case, demanding Marie reclean what's already clean. But our girl takes it in stride, she's managed to keep an optimistic view of life despite the craziness she's gone through. So the head maid gives Marie a new task, take care of some sick prisoner dude rotting away in the dungeon. Marie's like, um, do I have to? But the head maid is basically forcing her into it, asking who else would do such a nasty job if not totally talentless Marie? Ouch! With a guard leading the way, Marie heads to the dungeon. The moment she enters, a familiar smell hits her senses, just like when her mom was sick. The guard makes it clear this guy is a nobody just waiting around to die. He implies Marie shouldn't bother wasting too much effort on him. But our girl remembers her late mother's words to always be kind, no matter the sitch. So Marie decides she'll care for this sick prisoner with compassion in his lonely final days. Girl's got a heart of gold. The guard basically laughs in her face, calling her efforts useless, that word again. But then the prisoner starts violently coughing up blood. Marie starts gently cleaning the blood from his messy beard and mouth. Seeing the guy in such rough shape brings back memories of happier times with her mom, making Marie tear up. She wishes her mom was still around. After wiping her tears, the prisoner thanks her sincerely for helping him when she easily could have ditched such a gross job. But Marie is having none of it. She keeps tending to him kindly. The dude offers her his blessing and asks her name. I'm Marie, she says. He then asks if she has any wishes. Marie thinks for a bit before spilling her heart's desires, she wishes so badly to have all kinds of talents and abilities. Everything ranging from artistic skills, medical knowledge, combat expertise, you name it. She basically just wants the skills to live her best life and bring happiness to all around her. Marie then gets embarrassed by her seemingly impossible wishes. But the guy wants to know how she'd use all those mad abilities. Our girl explains she'd finally get to live the fulfilling life she's always wanted. The man says God wants to grant her wishes and asks for her real name. Nervously, Marie reveals the truth I am Princess Marina of the Clown Kingdom. The following day, Marie wakes up from a crazy vivid dream where she sees some maid named Viola flawlessly serving this rare tea called the Hong Pao to impress some fancy dude. He's totally fawning over her, calling Viola his greatest treasure. When Marie comes to, she's shook by how real it seemed. She starts questioning who this Viola chick is and why she knows the name of this obscure tea. It's bizarre but oddly familiar, weird. As Marie gets ready for her daily maid duties, she can't stop pondering that dream. She wonders if she's losing it for somehow recognizing a tea flavor she's never even tried. Her fellow maid Jane snaps her out of it, warning that their boss Susan will flip if Marie doesn't focus up and thoroughly clean. Marie silently wishes she had even half of Dream Viola's badass maid skills that she apparently uses to crush cleaning, laundry, dishes, paperwork and fancy tea service. Viola's like the LeBron James of maids, Marie would kill to be that legit. But when Marie sees the trashed hallway she's supposed to clean, she doubts finishing by Susan's inspection. Still, to her shock, she blazes through it in no time. Marie inspects the sparkling hall in disbelief, no way she pulled that off herself. Out the corner of her eye she spots the receptionist's grimy room. Just as Marie contemplates tidying that too, Susan's shrill voice screams at her for slacking. Susan stresses their swamped prepping for some count's visit but she freezes seeing Marie's spotless hallway masterpiece. Susan refuses to believe Marie didn't get help. But Marie swears she crushed it solo lying's not her thing. Susan still ain't buying it, so she reassigns Marie to the kitchen under her hawk-like watch. In comes Mary Kondo. Marie kicks but washing dishes too, leaving everyone shooketh. The head kitchen maid forces Marie to take a break because she's working at inhuman levels. 
sitting stunned in the corner, Marie soaks up the non-stop praise about her performance. She questions if the sick prisoner guy's prayer for her is somehow coming true? But how could that be possible? Still, she prays this miracle run continues. Susan interrupts again, summoning Marie for tea serving prep for some fancy upcoming event. Marie can't believe a lowly maid like herself gets to pour tea for actual nobles. She's excited but low-key freaking too. Later, Marie serves a noble lady tea with poise and elegance that totally dazzles her. ASUS Susan asks if Marie's done this before. Marie again wonders if the power of prayer is real after all. From then on, the other maids admire Marie, and her life takes a serious turn for the awesome. She becomes Maid Cinderella. But just when it seems Marie's living in a dream, another wild game-changing event lies just around the riverbend. A few months fly by and Susan hits Marie with some news, she's getting transferred to prep for some major imperial banquet. This is a huge deal since it coincides with the death anniversary of the late Empress, aka the Crown Prince's mom. They're revamping the Rose Garden at the Rose Palace in the Empress's honor. Marie asks if she'll be on gardening duty, but Susan says Marie will just be observing the garden makeover. When Susan asks if Marie has any issues with the gig, she mumbles that everything's fine. Outside Susan's office, Marie leans on the door, contemplating if her recent dream connects to the new garden assignment. In it, she saw some chick loving the wind blowing her hair, raving about how the winds were gonna inspire the garden seeker Fiona's work. Marie wonders who this garden-loving Fiona is. The next day, Marie reports to the Rose Palace and runs into that gardener guy she knows from her past palace days. He warmly welcomes her aboard. Over the next few days, Marie plays handy woman, grabbing any tools the garden squad needs while they work. Not too shabby, she expected way worse based on that intense dream. During lunch one day while gardener Hans munches his sandwich sitting on the dirt, he asks Marie if she's eating too. When she admits she hasn't, Hans reminds her to take care of herself despite their crazy schedule. Ah, he says she reminds him of his daughter. Sweet guy. Curious about his job, Marie asks what inspires Hans as a gardener. He explains a gardener's purpose is to spark happiness in visitors. Marie silently hopes she too can bring joy to people someday. Hans then spills his worries about the sculpture centerpiece, fearful the wrathful crown prince Rail will hate it. Rail has a gnarly reputation for violence and power moves. A scary memory flashes in Marie's mind, years ago Rail relentlessly hunted her down wielding a blood-soaked sword. Only disguising herself as a maid saved her life that day. Whoa, heavy stuff. Marie realizes she's the last of the Clown royal bloodline. Hans snaps Marie from her intense thoughts, signaling time to get back to the garden. She contemplates how to best help him out. That night Marie can't sleep. She feels oddly compelled to head outside for some fresh air. Her roomie Jane wakes up and asks where she's going, but Marie just vaguely says she needs some air. Out in the downpour, Marie hears a clanging sound from the garden and finds Hans trying to fix that troublesome sculpture. Worried he'll get sick, she tells him to take it easy and get inside. Hans realizes not much can be done in this weather anyway. After he leaves, Marie zones out staring at the half-finished statue, thinking of the garden girl Fiona again. Suddenly, Marie spaces out and sees Fiona sculpting like a straight-up pro. When she snaps out of it, Marie sees her own hands glowing magically. What? Meanwhile Prince Rail, rocking a mask, meets with Gilbert about festival prep. Gilbert promises everything will be perfect for celebrating the end of the war. Nice. Gilbert then mentions issues with a sculpture of Rail's late mom. He says he yelled at the sculptor and demanded they redo it or else. But Rail has zero clue why there's even a statue of his mom. He just asked them to tidy up generally. Rail gets pissed that Gilbert is threatening workers for no reason. He reminds Gilbert that swords should only be used on enemies and enforcing justice, not terrorizing his people. Rail decides it's about time to give Gilbert the boot. After Gilbert leaves, Rail takes off his mask, saying he wants to visit his mom's memorial. Walking the garden path, he can't believe it's been 10 years since she passed. Rail then hears the same clang clang Marie did earlier. He prays no one is sculpting in this nasty weather after Gilbert's harsh words. But on reaching the statue, Rail feels weirdly like he's looking at his actual mom. He tries to see who's sculpting but can't tell. 
Not wanting to disturb the mystery artist's flow, Rail dips without a sound. Come morning, the garden squad discovers the statue perfectly restored. A Shukhans knows he didn't finish it the night before. The other gardeners assume he did and start raining praise. But Hans keeps saying it wasn't him. Marie sneezes, distracting the crew from grilling Hans. After they fuss over her, she compliments the unbelievable statue craftsmanship. Hans again insists he ain't the sculptor behind the masterpiece. He says whoever did it captured the late Empress's spirit and dedicated some serious artisan hours. Marie is just happy there's no more statue drama. Right on cue Viscount Amund shows up asking who did the sculpture. Hans confirms he's the lead but when Amund says Prince Rail demands to see him, the poor guy panics begging not to be killed. But Rail tells Hans to stand and relax he actually wants to reward the artist for the sculpture's beauty. Caught off guard, Hans admits he didn't sculpt it himself. This jogs Rail's memory about the mystery figure from the rainy night. Rail asks Hans for the real sculptor's identity but Hans has nothing. Rail concludes an artistic angel descended from heaven, pulled off this miracle piece, then vanished without trace. Duke Orlin proposes Rail just made a mistake since no male sculptors match his description. And female sculptors are rare. But Rail sticks to his story. He knows what he witnessed and will get to the bottom of this mystery girl's magical sculpting tricks. His loyal boy Amund vows to investigate the case immediately. In the next scene, we flash back to when little Marie's mom passed. Her pops felt mad ashamed of her for some reason and demanded she be hidden away in the palace's most isolated corner. So Marie suffered constant mistreatment and scoldings from everyone, forcing her to withdraw from peeps. But her isolation actually let her disguise herself as a lowly maid when tragedy struck. With Prince Rail hunting the mystery sculptor, Marie's heart races with fear and surprise. Despite years passing, no one knows if Princess Marina is dead or alive. Marie worries Rail has uncovered her big secret identity and solemnly vows to lay low no matter what. The next day, festival fever hits the palace maids who are jazzed for the long-awaited event, cancelled the previous year. But in between the hype, Marie's mind wanders as she urgently rushes to her new Crystal Palace gig, missing the party vibes. Bummer! The orchestra's melodies will enchant the Crystal Palace this year. Marie wonders if this will unlock more hidden talents per her crazy dreams lately. Speaking of wild dreams, in this one, some desperate girl begged her brother to go to Paris ASAP because their dad was waiting. But the boy couldn't tear himself away from the surrounding sound music. Only mentioning their impatiently waiting father snapped him from his hypnotized state. Then the boy transformed into a grown Mozart banging flawlessly on a piano. In present day, Marie's on cleaning duty in the Crystal Palace music room, wondering if she'll finally get to hear the palace orchestra play at the big upcoming festival. Her eyes land on a majestic piano, plucking at memories of her long-lost piano playing passions. As Marie reaches to touch the shiny piano keys, a stern voice startles her. She whips around to find some guy warning her not to lay fingers on the freshly tuned piano. He asks if she's the maid assigned to help the orchestra. Marie confirms. He introduces himself as Bahan, the temporary concertmaster filling in for the previous retired conductor. Marie introduces herself back to conductor Bahan. She secretly admires how young he is for such an important gig, even temporarily. Before bouncing, Bahan assures Marie she can tickle the ivories later and to hit him up if any issues arise. As the day goes on, Marie delightedly watches Bahan lead the orchestra in rehearsing for the big festival. She's psyched to take in the tunes, even just during practice. But mid-jam, her ear catches the second violin and horn sections sounding off. Plus the tempo feels funky overall. Marie wonders, um, how do I know this so clearly? She flashes back to more weird dreams, perhaps another clue? But when Bahan asks Marie's opinion on the performance, she hesitates, unsure whether to spill the tea. In the end she fibs with a white lie that they sounded great. But Bahan reads the doubt all over Marie's face. He reveals the piece they just played was actually the previous conductor's work, not what he wanted them to rehearse. The musicians agree with Marie's vibe and beg Bahan to let them play his original composition instead, believing the audience will dig it more. Bahan refuses though, saying his piece isn't finished yet. A spirited debate fires up with the orchestra arguing for Bahan's song and him insisting they need to stick to the plan set list. Finally Bahan's like, fine, we can jam my song just to relax. 
As the exotic melodies fill the air, Marie finds herself utterly enchanted, imagining frolicking freely through a sunny field. But abruptly Bahan cuts the performance, saying they shouldn't continue. The musicians protest that his song brims with life compared to the other piece. But Bahan passionately argues that his piece, which he refers to as Baby, remains incomplete, forcing them back to rehearsing the original snooze fest. Leaning on the wall, Marie's imagination wanders, envisioning how freaking gorgeous the unfinished melody would sound if completed. She can practically hear the joyful notes herself. In her mind, the song feels absolutely complete already. As rehearsal wraps, the musicians bounce while intense Bahan stays fixed on his unfinished masterpiece. Mustering courage, Marie approaches him and offers any assistance to see the composition completed. Bahan chuckles at her sweet attempt to console him and thanks her gesture. He shares his burning desire for his song to reach its full potential and welcomes Marie's help to bridge gaps in finishing it. But he stresses the importance of keeping the final product his own vision. Marie assures she ain't trying to snake his glory. After Bahan takes off, Marie immediately starts jotting down possible missing elements for him to consider. Her goal is to help tie his creation together while ensuring it stays true to Bahan's style. Marie works stealthily to avoid any wandering eyes. Meanwhile, Gilbert chats with Prince Rail about his recent insomnia struggles, suggesting upping his sleep meds dosage. But their convo gets interrupted by an agitated Duke Orlin venting frustrations about the whole sculpture mystery girl situation. Rail sticks firm that his eyes don't deceive him about the magical sculptor. Orlin just wonders in exasperation where this ghost girl disappeared to. Rail says to chill, he just wants to thank her, not punish her for doing an unbelievable service. But Orlin argues they need to discipline her first before any reward, comparing her antics to those of the long-lost Princess Marina, who they've searched years for. Rail insists Marina's still kicking since there's zero proof she died. Interesting comparison. The tales say saintly 14-year-old Marina secretly aided the clown people while faceless and anonymous, helping the poor, supporting servants, healing the sick. Her humble influence left a huge mark, still remembered today. Orlin doubts they can find Marina if she's really alive after searching relentlessly for years. He's starting to think maybe she's just a fairy tale, made harder with her one portrait destroyed in the war. Rail respects Marina's character though, unlike all the other despicable Clown peeps. He declares firmly that locating Princess Marina is critical since Clown citizens haven't forgotten about her. When Orlin asks if Rail plans to execute Marina if found, Rail leaves the possibility open but doesn't outright say yes. Orlin suggests keeping her alive could be wise since she's the last Clown royal survivor. She could rally loyalty and supporters. Rail then reveals his scheme to marry Marina to win over the Clown people's hearts. But when Orlin asks what Rail will do if Marina rejects his proposal, he casually states he'll just eliminate her. Well all rightly then. Having secretly finished jotting the musical notes, Marie blows out the candle and sneaks away with no one the wiser. But walking off, her eyes once again catch that shiny grand piano, igniting an intense longing to hear the pieces performed. Meanwhile, Rail's evening stroll brings faint enchanting melodies drifting his way from the Crystal Palace to his ears. He decides to investigate the late-night piano jam sesh that's soothing his stressed soul so nicely. As he draws closer, the hypnotic notes resonate deeply within, conjuring cherished memories of his late mama and sister. Rail finds it hard to believe such a skilled pianist exists among the court performers. Determined to discover the mysterious musical genius, he hunts for the Crystal Palace entrance. Ironically, Marie exits just as Rail navigates the same halls to find the music room. And as fate would have it, they crash around a corner, sending poor Marie tumbling. Rail apologizes, helping her up. Peeping him, Marie notices his fine looks and figures he's likely a civilian from his outfit. Rail asks Marie for directions to the music room then further asks if she passed anyone on her way out. Marie says she didn't. But entering the empty room, Rail realizes the musician magician has vanished through some sneaky other exit. Stepping back outside, Rail asks the surrounding guards and servants if they saw anyone, but nope. Forced to surrender the chase, Rail decides he'll summon the music director tomorrow and grill him on the ivory tickler. Plus he'll request info from that girl he bumped into since she was just there. The next morning, aggressive knocking jolts Marie awake. A maid asks if anything weird happened the previous night before revealing has requested Marie's company at the Crystal Palace ASAP. 
In the music room, the musicians study Marie's composed sheet music, commenting on its originality compared to their previous conductor's work. Ah uh oh When Marie arrives and sees the sitch, she silently scolds herself for clearly being clueless about composing. Bahan asks who was the last to leave the room yesterday. Marie truthfully admits it was her. Bahan reveals the mystery music and questions if Marie is familiar with it. Desperately concealing her own doing, she lies that this is her first time seeing the notes. She also claims she didn't witness anyone after she left. Frustrated, Bahan shouts wondering who the heck is behind this musical miracle masterpiece. He resolves to find the genius composer to learn from them. Just then Amund barges in, telling Bahan the prince demands his audience. And Marie must come along too, much to her shock. Led by Amund, Marie enters the prince's office Loki wondering if he discovered her true identity. But she quickly chillaxes, reasoning if her secret was out she'd be chucked directly into prison already. Amund announces their arrival and opens the door after reminding them to stay poised. Inside Marie finds masked Prince Rail with Orlin. Marie, Bahan and Amund respectfully greet Rail. Marie reminds herself to seem oblivious, just a maid, not the clown princess. Rail stands and thanks Bahan for coming, explaining he wants to investigate something. Seated at the piano, Rail starts playing the exact music he heard the night before. Bahan's mind is blown that the crown prince is playing his original unfinished symphony. How does the prince know his piece? And Rail somehow continues playing perfectly where Bahan left off. An astonished Bahan questions if the prince is the legit composer. Rail stops, admitting he can't play beyond that point. Hopeful, he asks if Bahan recognizes the song. Bahan shares how he never finished the music himself and just found the arrangement that morning. He asks Rail if he wrote it then. Rail denies composing it, saying he only heard the melody once prior. He wonders if an Imperial band member could be responsible but Bahan says he already asked them and no one claimed it. Determined, Rail instructs Bahan to investigate again just in case. Bahan dips to follow orders. Meanwhile, Marie secretly freaks about how Rail knows her composed piece when she was so careful playing it alone. Orlin remarks how this reminds him of the statue sitch. Rail focuses on Marie, so she swiftly introduces herself. Rail asks if she saw the musician since she was the last one at the Crystal Palace. But Marie lies that she didn't hear any music after cleaning and saw no one enter or leave. Rail simply accepts this, but his piercing blue eyes send chills down Marie's spine. She can swear she's seen those eyes before. Rail then dismisses Marie but surprisingly requests she play piano before bouncing. Fear clutches Marie, worried her secrets out. She hesitates, claiming she lacks skill and would just unpleasantly plunk. But Rail doesn't care and tells her to play anyway. So Marie shakily sits, contemplating if she should fake it. But she knows Rail would notice that in a heartbeat, leaving her confused how to proceed. Nervously tinkling a few keys, Marie gets cut short by Rail saying that's enough, get back to work. As she leaves, Rail can't shake the vibe that Marie's no ordinary maid. Unlike others, she boldly meets his gaze. He wonders if she could be the gifted pianist of mystery. When Orlin asks why Rail asked Marie to play, Rail stays silent, but internally vows to keep a sharp watch on her, sensing there's more than meets the eye. Exiting Rail's office, Marie heads to the long-neglected and supposedly haunted Swan Garden for her new assignment. Ghost tales claim a white-haired specter roams the garden by day while a golden spirit haunts by night. Marie tries brushing off the spooky stories and focuses on work. But she jumps hearing some rustling before spotting a bird taking flight. Despite her fear, Marie knows ghosts don't kick it in broad daylight. She works up the courage to investigate further. Pushing past the bushes, Marie discovers a handsome white-haired man practicing sword fighting. After they both apologize for disturbing each other, Marie introduces herself to Imperial bodyguard Kiel. We learn there are two forces guarding the palace, the royal knights and the elite Imperial bodyguards loyal only to Emperor Thorn II. Since Kiel's not in uniform, Marie assumes he's a newbie squire. Her curiosity gets the best of her and she asks why he's training out here. Kiel explains he needed peaceful contemplation while practicing. As Marie observes his obvious skills, she finds it hard to believe this pro still needs training. A thought hits her then, if Kiel is the infamous white ghost, who's the golden spirit? Kiel kindly assists Marie with gardening until dusk. 
She thanks him, but Kiel brushes it off, saying he couldn't bear seeing her solo work. His kindness and handsomeness have captured Marie's attention for sure. When night falls, Kiel apologizes for not helping more and bids her farewell. After sincerely thanking him, Marie keeps working, determined to finish on time. Despite the increasing gloominess, Marie soldiers on. Eventually realizing it's getting too late, she decides to bounce. But then stumbles upon the pavilion of the late compassionate seventh princess, tragically poisoned amid the battle for the throne. Ever since her death, these gardens have been abandoned. Admiring the compassionate late seventh princess, Marie suddenly hears a startling voice behind her. Whipping around, she discovers it's the unfamiliar yet familiar face from her crystal palace run in the other night, aka the man she crashed into seeking the music. Though not recognizing him as Prince Rail since he lacks his trademark mask, Marie still wonders why this dude is lurking around the abandoned Swan Garden. Rail asks about her work, so she explains she's prepping the gardens for the upcoming festival. Rail then casually addresses her as Marie. Puzzled how he knows her name already, she confirms she's the one tending the pavilion when Rail asks. Confused why he cares, Marie asks for clarification, but Rail just walks away without explaining, leaving her surprised. She concludes Rail must be the rumored golden ghost. Marie finds it amusing both legendary ghosts turned out to be handsome guys. She assumes their paths won't cross again. But Marie is wrong. Over the following days, Charming Kiel keeps coming by to help her work, while Rail whom she now calls Nameless Man drops in at night. Marie ponders why these mysterious men are so intrigued by this unremarkable neglected area instead of more glamorous imperial grounds. Burning curiosity tempts her to just ask already. But she resists questioning them for fear of seeming rude or intrusive. Instead Marie buries herself in mountainous tasks, recalling an intriguing dream she had recently. Later, Marie asks Master Chef Peter at the Lily Palace to use his kitchen for snack making. Though he offers to help, determined Marie wants to solo create shortbread, cookies, cannoli and other goodies, inspired by her dream. In it, a mom lovingly bakes cookies for her sons before school, just like Marie's own late mama always did to comfort her during rough times. Resolving to lift Kiel and Nameless Man's spirits, she returns to gift a surprised Kiel some treats and thanks for his garden help. Curious when she found time to bake amidst work, Kiel compliments her thoughtfulness, making Marie blush and teasingly scold him for flattering her. But he insists his admiration is genuine before sincerely thanking her for the delicious snacks. Taking a bite, Kiel raves at the flavor. Marie bashfully shares she hopes to cheer him, sensing something's on his mind. She swiftly apologizes if she's overstepping. But easygoing Kiel reassures her and repeats his gratitude, a hint of sadness in his eyes. Later when Rail arrives, Marie presents the remaining goodies. Studying them, Rail makes Marie briefly regret not saving all for Kiel exclusively. She explains the variety of baked goods and says he needn't accept if they aren't to his tastes. However, gracious Rail accepts and thanks her work on the garden before departing, leaving Marie curious about his gratitude. Sitting alone, Rail reflects on his Marie run-ins regarding the statue and music, finding it strangely coincidental, as though fate keeps crossing their paths. Biting into a cookie, delicious flavors remind him of his deceased little sister, the seventh princess. Just then Kiel appears, prompting Rail to ask after his old friend, addressing him as Marquis. Kiel kneels, introducing himself formally as Sir Kiel Han de Seton, Imperial Head Knight. Rail then shatters the silence, bluntly calling Kiel an incompetent guard dog and questioning his lingering in the Swan Garden. Kiel swiftly apologizes for some past mistake, acknowledging the error on his part. But Rail says his late sister wouldn't blame Kiel for whatever happened. He then asks if Kiel has considered his proposal. However, Kiel states he cannot accept. Rail's anger simmers at Kiel's rejection. He considered them super close friends. Rail questions if Kiel really believes the comatose emperor will ever wake up, and Kiel admits he doubts it. This sparks Rail's frustration further. He asks why Kiel is wasting away guarding an unconscious emperor. But loyal Kiel insists it's his duty. Rail finds it wild that Kiel would prioritize a comatose leader over their bond. He wonders if it's because the Emperor never named Kiel his heir. We learn apart from the Emperor, Kiel's Seton warrior clan rules the military with 30,000 soldiers, serving since the Empire's origins. Only the Emperor can appoint the Seton heir, which is presently Kiel as head Imperial Knight and Guardian of the Northwest region. 
Rayo concludes Kiel just sees him as a Seton clan thrown usurper. Crushing a flower, Rayo questions if Kiel ever considered why he proposed alliance. Rayo reveals he approached Kiel because he didn't want to have to kill his friend. He point blank asks if Kiel thinks he's incapable of taking him down. We learn Rayo, Kiel, and Orlin were childhood BFFs, sharing countless memories. Although Rail and Kiel were particularly tight, Kiel was actually Princess Seven's devoted bodyguard. She adored him greatly. Kiel gives Rail a hard no that he couldn't kill him. Rail asks one final time if Kiel will accept his proposal, but Kiel refuses. A frustrated Rail mutters Kiel should keep following his clanway then storms off. As Rail leaves, Kiel reflects on the princess's tragic poisoning death by tea in this very garden previously, devastating Rail profoundly. Kiel's thoughts turn to Marie's kindness gifting him cookies, while heavy-hearted Rail recalls joyful times with Kiel and his sister, their paths now split by history's weight. The next day, the Clown townspeople are hyped discussing the upcoming festival and recent peace vibes. Word spreads that Crown Prince Rail might do a food giveaway during the event, which the people appreciate after crushing war taxes strained everyone financially. Rail wants to ease that burden. His homeboy, Orlin promises a fun festival surprise in store. But then the plot thickens, the rival Western Empire is sending a delegation to celebrate too, weirdly enough. Rail scratches his noggin, finding the timing odd since Clown vs West beefing runs deep historically. He suspects they have ulterior motives to exploit Clown while rebuilding, maybe gain some intel and leverage. Rumor also says the West seeks missing Princess Marina too. If they locate her first, it could threaten Clown's sovereignty. When Rail asks about the delegation size, Orlin reveals 200 strong, mostly royal knights. Now Rail is convinced they plan some bold power move military demonstration. But he remains arrogantly confident in teaching them a lesson if they try anything sneaky. Orlin clarifies the brigade is guarding one VIP mystery guest. His sources indicate whoever has major significance, possibly West Empire nobility? The three-day fancy schmancy diplomatic banquet itself will actually go down at the Lily Palace. When Rail hears that, random thoughts of Murray start drifting into his brain out of nowhere. Weird, wonder what that's about. Speaking of Murray, Chef Pete calls her to the creepy Lily Palace basement to fetch meat. Clutching her lamp descending the dingy steps, Marie comments on the sudden chill. Pete explains their special underground meat cellar keeps everything fresh. Chef Pete thanks Marie in advance for pitching in come banquet crunch time. He's stressing about impressing all the noble VIP guests, including tough customer Crown Prince Rail and the surprise West Empire Foreign Brigade. At least dish duty means Marie dodges awkward run-ins with Prince Killjoy. She compliments Pete's boss-level cooking skills to cheer him up as they review the ingredient veal meat. Pete explains their creepy underground freezer is crucial to prevent bacteria spread and maintain high meat standards. But thanks to recent rains, humidity seeped in jeopardizing conditions. Pete's frustrated having to toss spoiled batches. With the huge banquet just two days out, he worries about sourcing enough quality meat to avoid total embarrassment. On his way out, Gilbert overhears and reprimands Pete's storage failure. He emphasizes the time crunch with the major diplomatic event looming. Pete promises close monitoring to manage the remaining fresh meat. That night, Marie's brainstorms spoilage solutions while drifting off, hoping to somehow help Pete. In her cooking competition dream, she whips up a winning dish that seems oddly familiar. Marie awakens with remnants of the dream still swirling a day before the grand reception. Horrifically, Chef Pete discovers more meat decay overnight despite their efforts to prevent such. It's a total disaster. An assistant suggests herb masking aromas, but Pete knows that won't solve the root cause. He sends his team scrambling to snag all new quality protein sources last minute. The staffers worry about unvetted backup meat quality. A defeated Pete declares this his swan song dish. Watching anxiously, determined Marie racks her brain to save Pete's hide. Then it hits her, the winning beef dish from her dream. As she considers suggesting it, none other than Crown Prince Rail startles her from behind, asking about banquet prep issues. Marie freezes, his commanding yet curious tone sending chills down her spine. All the staff snap to attention, bowing low in respect. The prince, not one for formalities, tells them to cut it out and get back to work. He'd heard there was a bit of a hiccup in the kitchen, and he decided to check it out. 
Chef Peter is all nerves as he admits to the meat fiasco, apologizing profusely for messing up. Rail, hands on his face, can't believe what he's hearing. They've got a major banquet coming up and the star dish is out of the picture. Peter tries to salvage the situation by saying he's ordered some new meat, but Rail isn't having it. He can't stomach the thought of serving second-rate meat to the guests, especially with the Western delegation attending. The last thing he needs is them gossiping about his budget banquet. Peter, still shaking like a leaf, offers to punish himself, a bit dramatic if you ask me, and apologizes again. But Rail tells him to quit the sorry act and figure out a solution. He asks if there's any other dish they can whip up or a way to jazz up the cheap meat, but Peter admits he's at a loss. Just when things are looking bleak, in steps Marie. She's had a dream about a dish that could save the day. But how does she tell this to Chef Peter, let alone the prince? As her eyes accidentally meet Rails, she quickly looks away. Why did he have to notice her now? Rail, intrigued, asks who she is. She introduces herself, not daring to look up. He remembers her delicious cookies and wonders if she can pull off a main course. He asks her if she has any ideas for a dish, but one of the chefs tries to brush her off, saying she's just a maid and doesn't know squat about cooking. But Rail isn't about to let some snooty chef dismiss Marie. He tells him to zip it and focuses back on Marie. He asks her if she knows how to turn this cheap meat into a five-star main course. Now, a main course usually revolves around a hunk of meat. And trying to beat a classic steak? That's no small feat, but Marie's dream dish might just be the game-changer they need. She considers playing dumb, but decides to help out Peter instead. She reveals that she knows the recipe her mom used to make that works wonders with low-quality meat. It might not be as fancy as steak, but it's got a unique taste that could win over the guests. Despite never having made it before, she explains the recipe to Rail. He gives her the green light and promises to be the first to taste her dish. With that, Marie gets to work, surprisingly calm considering the stakes. Fast forward a bit, and the guests are arriving for the banquet. We see Count Schober from the Western Empire chatting with Marquis Drake. They're eagerly awaiting Rail's entrance and discussing rumors about a new emperor in the West. Schober dismisses Rail as a naive youngster compared to their Emperor Johannes III. They also speculate about the meal, knowing about the meat situation, when Rail finally makes his grand entrance. Rail thanks everyone for coming and watches as the food is served. Count Schober assumes they're serving some shoddy dish disguised as a delicacy and takes a bite, curious to see what they've come up with. His eyes widen in surprise, it's actually good. He didn't expect such a flavor fiesta from the Easterners. As the anticipation builds, he can't help but wonder what the main course will taste like. Finally, the star of the show arrives, and boy does it look tasty. Schober, though skeptical about its quality, decides to give it a shot. He takes a bite and, bam! Flavor explosion! Who knew the East had such culinary prowess? Rewind a bit, and we've got Marie slaving away in the kitchen. She's following the dream recipe to A.T., hoping against hope that it'll impress Rail. And voila! The dish is ready for its royal taste test. Fast forward again, and the banquet is buzzing with excitement. Everyone's raving about the food, calling it a culinary masterpiece. Rail, remembering his promise to reward Marie, tries to give her a bonus. But Marie, being the humble soul she is, declines. Rail, not one to give up, promises to call her after the banquet. As he leaves, all eyes turn to Marie. The chefs are dying to know who taught her to cook like that. Meanwhile, Rail announces the name of the dish, Salisbury steak, or Hamburg steak for the purists. Seeing the guest's satisfaction, he starts thinking about promoting Marie to the illustrious Lion Palace. As the night winds down, a stranger approaches Schober. He's surprised at how good the food was and Schober addresses him as your highness. Plot twist, it's Emperor Johannes III. He tells Schober to drop the formalities since he's here under the radar. Johannes is a bit of a legend back west. He took the throne at 15, and within a decade, he's turned his chaotic empire into a beacon of peace and stability. He's known for his good looks, resourcefulness, and kindness. But don't let that fool you, he's got his fair share of flaws too. Schober starts fretting about potential risks. He suggests they head back home before Rail discovers Johannes's true identity. But Johannes isn't worried. 
he doesn't think the Easterners would dare harm him if they want to keep the peace. Schober argues that there was no need for Johannes to attend the festival in the first place. But Johannes reveals that they're here on a mission to find Princess Marina rumored to be hiding out in the east. Johannes believes that the Easterners are clueless about these rumors or else they'd be searching high and low for her. Schober, still worried, asks after Johannes's health, fearing an attack while they're in Klauen. But Johannes assures him that he's been taking his meds and hasn't had an episode in six months. He then changes the subject, expressing his eagerness to meet Marina and bring her over to his side. Marie wakes up from another one of her wild dreams. This time, she's part of a carriage crash scene, with an injured stranger begging for help. A man rushes over to apply pressure on the wound, but it's no use. Marie wakes up in a cold sweat, her heart pounding like a drum. She can't help but wonder what these dreams mean. Are they random thoughts or do they hold some deeper significance? Meanwhile, the festival is in full swing. Fireworks light up the night sky and the crowd is buzzing with excitement. But Marie isn't out there soaking up the festive vibes. Nope, she's stuck in the kitchen, working her little heart out while everyone else parties. Jane, her fellow maid, pops out of the kitchen carrying a load of trash. She asks Marie if she's eaten yet. Marie just shakes her head, too preoccupied with her latest dream to even think about food. Jane can't wait to try the banquet spread. But Marie is lost in thought, trying to decipher her dream. Jane notices her distraction and asks if she's okay. Marie reassures her that everything's fine and heads back inside. Back in the kitchen, Marie is handed a pile of trash to dispose of. As she trudges outside, she makes a silent wish for everyone's safety during the festival. Suddenly, someone calls out to her, telling her that Susan is looking for her. Marie quickly dumps the trash and rushes over to Susan. Susan has some big news, Marie's been assigned to Gloria Hall, the venue for tomorrow's main banquet. Marie is taken aback. She asks if she's supposed to clean up after the banquet or help out in the kitchen. But Susan drops a bombshell, Marie will be attending the banquet. This is a huge deal, usually only mid-rank maids get to attend these events. Marie can't believe it. She's a low-rank maid, and while it's not unheard of for maids like her to move up the ranks, it usually takes years of service. This sudden promotion leaves her in a daze. The next day, Marie slips into her new mid-ranked maid uniform. It's much fancier than her usual outfit. She wonders if she can return to her old duties once the festival is over. Susan tells her that she'll be working at the Lion Palace from now on. Marie isn't thrilled about this prospect and hopes she can convince Susan to change her mind. At Gloria Hall, the head maid is surprised to learn that Marie was born in Clowen and used to work at the Lily Palace. After giving her a rundown of her duties, the head maid decides to keep a close eye on Marie, despite Susan's reassurances. During the banquet, Marie has the task of serving drinks. She watches as nobles and royals from all over mingle and chat. As the music starts, she spots Prince Rail sitting on his throne, looking bored. Their eyes meet for a moment, and Marie quickly looks away. But she can't shake off the feeling that he's still watching her. She decides to move away, but just as she's about to leave, the prince calls out her name. We're left in suspense as the scene shifts to the previous where Rail and Almond are chillin' in the office. Almond offers Rail a drink, but Rail's like, nah, man. I'm good. He's already stuffed from all that food and can't imagine squeezing in another drop of anything. He starts complaining about how exhausting it is to host back-to-back -back parties. Orlin points out that usually, an empress or crown princess would handle all the event planning. This leads to Orlin subtly nudging Rail about his marital status. Apparently, the Senate is getting antsy and wants answers by the end of the festival. Rail gets it, but he tells Orlin he wants to make sure he chooses the right person for the sake of the Empire. Later, Rail goes on his usual late-night stroll. The night is alive with fireworks, and he enjoys the bustling atmosphere. As he watches the maids scurrying about, he hopes to spot Marie among them. He wonders if his interest in her is just because he had won too many drinks at the banquet. But he decides to hang around a bit longer, curious about what he'd do if he bumps into her. Suddenly, he hears someone calling Marie's name. Quick as a flash, he ducks behind a tree as Marie appears, lugging a heavy trash bag. He watches her from his hiding spot, impressed by how she handles the hefty load despite her petite frame. 
He remembers the cookies she made for him and realizes he never properly thanked her. Before he can ponder this further, another call for Marie interrupts his thoughts, and he stays hidden as she rushes off to respond. On the next party night, Orlin is busy pointing out potential brides for Rail. But Rail doesn't seem interested. He's got his eyes set on Princess Marina. In the crowd, he spots Marie's shiny hair as she serves drinks. They lock eyes for a moment before Marie quickly looks away. Rail finds her bustling around amusing, comparing her to a busy little squirrel. The music playing is decent, but it doesn't quite match up to that one masterpiece he heard before. Suddenly, he locks eyes with Marie again. On a whim, he calls her over. She brings him his requested strawberry juice and checks if he needs anything else. Rail assures her he's good, and she walks off. Orlin notices Rail's odd behavior and asks if something's up, but he brushes it off, saying everything's fine, while he continues watching Marie from the corner of his eye. Marie, relieved to be out of Rail's sight, is handed another tray of drinks to serve guests on the balcony. As she turns around, she bumps into Johannes, spilling the drinks and shattering the glasses. She stumbles backward, but Johannes catches her just in time. He asks if she's okay, but instead of answering, she starts apologizing. Johannes cuts her off, asking her to relax, and addresses her as my lady while still holding her. Now, that's some drama! Marie, after being caught off guard by Johannes' smooth save, assures him that she's totally fine. She steps back, awkwardly removing herself from his arms, and immediately starts apologizing for the drink spilling fiasco. She's mortified about staining his clothes, but Johannes, chill as ever, jokes that he can just change his outfit. His laid-back response lightens the mood, and Marie, amused, offers to fetch him a new suit. She even goes as far as suggesting she could wash his stained clothes. With that, she scurries off, leaving Johannes in stitches, and finds herself thinking, man, I sure do bump into a lot of cute guys these days. As she rushes off, Johannes watches her go, muttering something about her being quite a catch. Meanwhile, Johannes is waiting for Marie to return with his new outfit, all while brainstorming about how to track down Princess Marina. He's been playing detective for a while now, crossing off names of potential Marina's left and right, including Sonia. Despite grilling all the maids who used to work at the royal palace after the Clown Kingdom fell, he hasn't had any luck. He thought he'd recognize Marina when he saw her, even though he doesn't know what she looks like, but so far, no dice. But he's not giving up. Time is ticking, and he's determined to find Marina ASAP. Out of the blue, Johannes gets hit with a wave of severe chest pain, and his heart starts racing like a marathon runner. He quickly reaches for his white pills, but they don't do squat. He's getting dizzy, and he recalls his doctor's advice about needing blue pills in such situations. He crumples to the floor, desperately searching for the elusive blue pills, but it's a no-go. He's thinking, I can't just lie here. But before he can figure out who's approaching him, everything goes black. Marie returns with Johanna's fresh suit, only to find him sprawled out on the floor, unconscious. She rushes over and checks his pulse, which is barely there. Realizing that he's having a heart attack, she doesn't even bother with the meds lying around, knowing they'd only make things worse. Instead, she rummages through his pocket and finds the blue pills, blood pressure stimulants. She pops one into his mouth, but since he's out cold, he can't swallow it. Thinking on her feet, she takes a sip of water and transfers it to his mouth, hoping it'll do the trick. Suddenly, his pulse flatlines, and Marie starts doing chest compressions. Even though she feels like she's in over her head, she keeps going, determined not to let another life slip away. Finally, his heart starts beating again, and he coughs, signaling that he's alive. Marie lets out a huge sigh of relief. The next morning, Johannes wakes up to find his doctor and Schober, who immediately bursts into tears. The doc tells Johannes that he was pretty much knocking on death's door, and his decision to leave the palace might have triggered the attack due to a reduced medication dose. But no worries, the doc assures him, they'll crank his dosage back up. Johannes is grateful, and he realizes that those blue pills were a literal lifesaver. But he doesn't remember taking them and wonders if it was all just a dream. The doctor confirms that he did indeed take the blue pills, he counted them, and commends the quick thinking of whoever saved Johannes' life. Johannes wants to thank his mystery savior and asks for their identity, only to find out it was a maid. He's blown away by her skills and can't wait to thank her. And that, my friends, is how Johannes survived a heart attack, thanks to our heroine Marie. 
Next scene, Marie is off to visit Johannes's room. She's wondering why she has to meet this guy, especially after she just managed to dodge a bullet with the crown prince. So, she goes in and is like, hey, I'm still working on cleaning that jacket of yours. Johannes acknowledges this but says he called her over because he wanted to ask her something. Marie tells him to go ahead and ask, promising she won't mind. However, Johannes explains that he prefers to keep things official with people he isn't close with. Now, Marie knows this guy is no joke. She remembers him as the ruler who didn't hesitate to spill blood to restore order to his empire. In her eyes, he's a ruthless leader who will stop at nothing to achieve his goals. Heck, the guy even killed a duke on his first day as ruler. Suddenly, Johannes asks Marie if she saw anyone else around him when he was unconscious. She truthfully tells him it was just him alone on the balcony. Johannes doesn't think Marie is lying, but he can't shake off his suspicions. He calls her over and despite her reservations, she moves closer. But apparently, that's not close enough for Johannes, who insists she comes even closer. So, she does, only for him to abruptly grab her hands. Marie, caught off guard, quickly pulls her hands away. Johannes mumbles an apology and makes up some lame excuse about wanting to check out her hands. Just as this awkwardness is unfolding, Rayo comes in, fuming like a volcano ready to erupt. He demands Marie to join him, and she does, happy to escape the uncomfortable situation. Rayo then confronts Johannes, commenting that he doesn't seem as sick as the rumors suggested. Johannes tries to lighten the mood, but Rayo isn't having any of it. He declares they aren't pals and even accuses Johannes of touching his stuff. This revelation leaves both Marie and Johannes stunned. Rayo warns Johannes that he'll kick him out once he's better and storms off, with Marie trailing behind. Johannes is left scratching his head, wondering why Rayo reacted so strongly. He decides to stick around a bit longer to figure out what's up with Marie. Meanwhile, Rayo is stomping down the hallway when he hears Marie calling after him. He turns around and tells her she can leave. As she walks away, her mind is swirling with questions about what Rayo meant by his cryptic words. It's party time and our girl Marie is keeping a low profile. She's decided to hang out outside rather than inside the bustling banquet hall, hoping to avoid any unnecessary encounters with the prince. As she busies herself with work, she spots Kiel strolling in. He's all smiles when he sees her new uniform, and he's quick to congratulate her on the promotion. Marie, noticing his night uniform, teases him about being stuck on duty. He laughs it off, confirming her suspicions, which doesn't really come as a surprise. The two of them get lost in conversation for a bit before Marie has to excuse herself to get back to work. But not before promising to come back later. True to her word, Marie returns with a sandwich she whipped up for Kiel, knowing that he'd probably be starving after his shift. He's touched by the gesture, and they spend some time together, chatting about random stuff like the weather. Even though their conversation isn't exactly deep, Marie finds herself enjoying Kiel's company. She feels comfortable around him, like she's found a genuine friend. Curiosity piqued, Marie asks Kiel if he plans to stick around in his current position. He admits that he's just filling in since everyone else is busy. They're interrupted by a young boy bolting towards Kiel. At first, Marie mistakes the kid for a girl because of his cuteness, but it turns out he's the 10th prince, Prince Oscar. Following Kiel's lead, Marie greets the boy respectfully. Prince Oscar starts grilling Marie about who she is and why she's hanging out with Kiel. He even has the audacity to call her unattractive. He then stakes his claim on Kiel, insisting that Kiel should always be with him. Kiel quickly jumps to Marie's defense, insisting she's important to him. This doesn't sit well with Oscar, who can't fathom why Kiel would choose to hang out with Marie over him. That night, Marie dreams about a man trying to impress a boy with a magic trick. But the boy isn't impressed and promises to show the man some real magic instead. The next evening, as Marie is busy attending to the banquet guests, Prince Oscar pops out of nowhere, asking her what she's up to. She tells him she's working and asks him the same question. Oscar proudly announces that he's attending the banquet and informs her that he has a request for her. He then proceeds to ask her to show him the banquet hall. Marie provides directions to the hall, but she can't help but notice that he's unaccompanied by his bodyguards or maids. When she questions Oscar about their absence, he defiantly refuses to answer and instead insults her, referring to her as an ugly maid. 
Despite his rudeness, Marie leads the way to the bustling hall filled with people, where Oscar stands silently in the middle of the room. That night, Marie's dreams take a different turn. Her dream whisks her back to her childhood days in the Clown Palace, and boy, it ain't pretty. She's getting roasted by her elder brothers for being born out of wedlock, and even the maids are having a good laugh at her expense. The bullies give her the nickname Marina and banish her to the cold side of the palace. After a tearful chase scene and an accidental dip in the lake, Marie wakes up, shocked that this old dream decided to make a comeback. Shaking off the memories, she gets ready for another day, reminding herself that those jerks are long gone. As she gears up for work, she can't help but think about the upcoming grand banquet, the highlight of the festival. It's a masked ball, which sounds like a blast, but Marie isn't exactly thrilled. She's more excited about the two-day break she'll get afterward. But what's really eating at her is the selection of the crown princess that happens post-banquet. Even though she couldn't care less who gets the title, she wonders if she should stick around before it all goes down. Later that day, Prince Oscar crosses paths with Marie. He throws some shade her way, calling her ugly. In response, she asks him about his plans for the banquet. He scoffs, saying he's already been there and has no intention of going back because everyone ignored him. Poor Oscar, always playing second fiddle to rail. Marie tries to cheer him up by offering juice and crackers, but he rejects both. Suddenly, she remembers her dream and comes up with a plan to distract Oscar. She proposes a game, she'll perform a magic trick, and if Oscar can figure out how she did it, he wins. If not, she wins, and the loser has to do whatever the winner says. Sounds fair, right? Oscar agrees. Marie starts off with a coin trick, hiding it in one hand and asking Oscar to guess where it is. He picks the wrong hand, and when he checks the other, the coin is gone. Then she pulls off another trick, making the coin disappear in a glass of water. Oscar is completely taken aback, and he's desperate to know how she did it. Marie, triumphant, declares that she's won, but Oscar interrupts her. He insists he didn't lose because this is his first time seeing magic. He wants to learn more about it before accepting defeat and dashes off, leaving Marie dumbfounded. As she watches him go, she can't help but think about her own childhood. She hopes that Oscar will have better luck than she did and silently prays for him. But her thoughts are interrupted by Kiel, who's been standing behind her this whole time. And let me tell you, folks, Marie nearly jumps out of her skin at the sight of him. What a roller coaster of a day, huh? Meanwhile, from a concealed spot, Rail watches her work her magic on Oscar and can't help but feel a pain of something. He's thinking, man, this girl's talents are going to waste as a mere maid. But his detective instincts kick in when he realizes that she's not just a great cook but also has some serious magic skills. Could she be the mastermind behind the sculpture and the music? His curiosity is off the charts. Meanwhile, Kiel decides to make his move. He saunters over to Marie, casually mentioning that he saw her with Oscar and thanking her for being nice to the kid. Then he calls her lovely and compassionate. Marie, caught off guard, turns as red as a tomato. Smooth move, Kiel. Kiel reveals that he's the only one Oscar has truly opened up to, which gets Marie wondering how they became so close. Gathering all her bravery, she asks for his full name, suspecting that he's not just any old bodyguard. Kiel, surprised by her sudden curiosity, decides to spill the beans. Marie's mind is blown when she hears his name. He apologizes for keeping her in the dark but reassures her that it wasn't intentional. Marie, ever the polite one, bows and asks for his understanding about her manners. In response, Kiel does something unexpected, he kneels before her, claiming that he considers her a friend. Marie hesitates, worried that their social statuses might come in the way of a real friendship. Kiel, sensitive to her concerns, backs off, but not before expressing his fondness for her and asking if she could consider him a friend. All this while, Rail is fuming. He's not sure why he's so bothered by their interaction, but he can't stand seeing Marie kneeling before Kiel for so long. And when she finally takes Kiel's hand, Rail can't take it anymore and storms off. Little does he know, someone else has been watching the whole drama unfold from their own secret spot. Oh, the intrigue! After that, Marie crosses paths with Bahan, an old friend she hasn't seen for ages. They share a warm, friendly hello and she gives him a hearty pat on the back for his new gig as the royal conductor. 
Bahan, always the modest one, brushes it off, claiming the real musical genius is still out there somewhere. Marie asks about the rest of the band, and Bahan tells her they're off hunting down their instruments. Just as Marie's about to head off to help a co-worker, she wishes Bahan luck with a cheerful wave. Marie heads into the dim storage room on a mission, find the tablecloth. As she's digging through a cupboard, she stumbles upon masks for the upcoming masquerade ball. She can't resist trying one on for size, before setting it back down, mentally ticking off the days until the festival's grand finale. A lingering sense of unease washes over her, fueled by a recurring dream and a hope that the banquet goes off without a hitch. Her gaze lands on an old piano tucked away in the corner. She taps a key and jumps at the sound it makes. Fighting the urge to play again, she scolds herself and heads out of the room, a mix of curiosity and fear following her out. Back in the banquet hall, Marie senses something's up. As she hands off the tablecloth to her boss, she hears the shocking news, there's been a fire. The orchestra's instruments are toast. Bahan's left scratching his head, wondering how to keep the guests entertained. Someone suggests postponing the performance, but Bahan shoots it down. This isn't just any old dinner party, there are VIPs in attendance. Even the guests start to pick up on the tension. But Bahan's not giving up. He decides to make do with what they've got, a violin, a viola, and a cello. It's not ideal, but he won't let the night be ruined. As Bahan hopes for a miracle, he hears it, the sweet sound of a piano. Little does he know, Marie's taken it upon herself to play the piano from the storage room. The guests are transfixed by the music, comparing it to the soft touch of an angel. Rail recognizes the tune from the Crystal Palace and decides to find the source. Meanwhile, Marie's heart is pounding as she plays, worried she'll be discovered. She plans to quickly wrap up the prelude so she can get back to the banquet hall. Bahan can start the dance music after the prelude with the remaining instruments, giving her a chance to make a quick exit before anyone finds her upstairs. As Marie finishes off the prelude, she makes a break for it, planning to pretend she's been on the second floor serving all along. Bahan cues the dance music, providing the perfect cover for her escape. But as she hurries down the stairs, the sound of footsteps stops her in her tracks. She turns to see the prince climbing the stairs, a mix of shock and fear flooding her mind. Rail, intrigued by the secret pianist's enchanting melody, decides to play detective. He sneaks into the storage room and pokes around, trying out a few notes on the old piano. His eyes dart around the room, but he finds no sign of the mystery musician. Guessing that they must still be upstairs, he opts not to search the cupboards and leaves the room. Little does he know, Marie is hiding in one of those very cupboards. As soon as Rail leaves, she breathes a sigh of relief, dusts herself off, and slips away unnoticed. Or so she thinks. Back in the banquet hall, the headmaid is waiting for her with a raised eyebrow. Where have you been? she asks. Marie quickly comes up with an excuse and gets back to work serving drinks. She can't help but overhear the guests chatter, they're all raving about the orchestra's performance, and especially the surprise piano solo. Rumors start to swirl about an angelic pianist, and Marie has to suppress a giggle. If only they knew the truth. Meanwhile, Susan rushes over with some shocking news, Jane has been arrested. Apparently, she's being blamed for the fire in the instrument storage room. Marie's heart sinks, she knows Jane, and she's always meticulous about safety. Something doesn't add up. Marie rushes to visit Jane, who's understandably distraught. Jane insists that she double-checked everything before leaving the room, and Marie believes her. She promises Jane that she'll get to the bottom of this, then hurries off to investigate the scene of the fire. But when she arrives, she's stopped by a knight from the Imperial bodyguard. He refuses to let her through, even when she tries to bluff her way in. He says something vague about irregularities in the fire, which only makes Marie more suspicious. But with no way to get past the knight, she's forced to retreat and come up with a new plan. Just as she's deep in thought, Kiel appears out of nowhere and calls her name. Surprised, Marie turns to face him, wondering what he could possibly want at a time like this. Caught in a tough spot, Marie knows she needs to pull some strings to clear Jane's name. She hates to play the friend card with Kiel, but hey, desperate times call for desperate measures. So, she gathers her courage and asks Kiel for a favor, to let her into the storage room because she left something important in there. 
Kiel agrees to tag along, ready to face any music that may follow. The knight at the entrance isn't thrilled about this, but Kiel's decision is final. As they head towards the storage room, Marie apologizes for dragging Kiel into this mess. He brushes it off and drops a bombshell, he's also got some investigating to do in there. Intrigued, Marie wonders out loud if Kiel thinks the fire was intentional. His surprised look tells her he hadn't considered it, but he admits the timing does seem fishy. He assures her that the royal guards have got it under control. Marie slips up and calls him my lord, to which he requests she uses his name when they're alone. This request throws Marie for a loop. When they reach the storage room, everything is charred black. But Marie isn't deterred, she's determined to prove Jane's innocence. She gets to work, sifting through the wreckage. Despite the most promising area being destroyed, she presses on, exploring another part of the room. And then, bingo! She finds something that could prove Jane didn't start the fire. Kiel asks if she found her missing item. With a mysterious smile, Marie says she hasn't found it yet. She wonders if she'll be trusted with her newfound evidence, knowing her influence is limited. She decides to spill the beans to Kiel, hoping he'll hear her out. She asks if there's any evidence pointing to arson, and he explains the damage has made it difficult to find any. Marie then asks if he has any suspects, and he confirms he does. He reveals that a witness saw someone suspicious near the scene. Just as Marie's about to share her theory about the fire, Rail shows up with Orlin following him. He's surprised to see Marie there and asks Kiel if he's found any evidence pointing to the Westerners. Kiel admits the fire's severity has slowed their progress. Rail is convinced it's the Westerners doing, which could lead to a diplomatic crisis. He claims he might know who the culprit is. Caught in the chaos, Kiel asks Marie if she has any information about the fire. Rail perks up and urges her to speak. Knowing she needs to clear Jane's name, Marie boldly states that the fire was no accident. Rail demands proof, and Marie confidently says she has it. With all eyes on her, she gets ready to reveal everything she knows. With a spark of confidence in her eyes, Marie lays it all out, the fire was no accident, but a calculated act of arson. She points out the oddity of the fire's origin, it wasn't just a lamp that fell and caused the blaze, but rather a separate flame that ignited the gas inside a lamp, evident from the scorch marks on the wall. Rail raises an eyebrow at her assertion, intrigued by her sharp deduction. Just then, Johannes steps forward from the shadows, startling everyone with his sudden appearance. Marie inwardly groans, Johannes being here just complicates things further. Rail, not thrilled about Johannes' presence, reminds him he was asked to leave earlier. Johannes shrugs it off, saying he heard some rumors implicating his empire in the fire and wanted to clear the air. Rail snaps back, bringing up Schober's suspicious presence near the scene when the fire broke out. He insists they need to hear Marie's side of the story. Marie, undeterred by the escalating tension, starts presenting her evidence. She shows them the burn patterns on the violin and other instruments, indicating the fire didn't originate from a lamp. Next, she points out the peculiar fall of a pillar, if the fire had started from a lamp, the pillar would have fallen the other way. As she unveils more evidence, even the skeptical Rail, Kiel, and Orlin are taken aback. She presents the final piece of her case, the candle drippings, suggesting a candle was used to set the fire, confirming Orlin's suspicion of foul play. Johannes claps in appreciation, impressed by Marie's keen observation skills. He finds himself drawn to her intelligence, wondering if she had anything to do with his recent health scare. Marie, however, is keen on keeping a low profile and avoiding any more attention from Johannes. He asks if she knows who the culprit is. Marie hesitates, worried about stirring up more trouble. But Rail steps in, telling Johannes they'll question the most suspicious individuals first. Johannes fires back, accusing Rail of plotting to frame the Western Empire. Rail coolly responds that the investigation will uncover the truth. Johannes, riled up by Rail's response, hints at the strength of his empire's knights. Kiel reaches for his sword, demanding to know if Johannes is issuing a threat. Marie knows she needs to steer the conversation away from escalating tensions. She suggests that Schober might not be the firestarter, pointing out small footprints on the floor that look like a child's. She notes these footprints only lead out of the room, suggesting they were made when the fire started. She also draws attention to a damaged candelabra, hinting that the real culprit is someone of high status. 
She speculates that the fire could have been an accident, not part of a grand scheme. Johannes is captivated by Marie's analytical skills and considers bringing her back to the Western Empire. Rail finds her evidence useful for the investigation, while Orlin hints at a potential suspect. Kiel thinks along the same lines, but doubts their capability to execute such a plan. After the whirlwind of events, Marie feels like she's just stepped off a roller coaster. Jane is no longer a suspect, and war with the Western Empire has been averted, for now. As she heads to the prince's office, she can't help but worry about the person they're now blaming for the fire. Will they be out for revenge? As she rounds the corner, she spots Amund waiting by the door. He misinterprets her worried look for nerves and reassures her that the prince isn't as scary as the rumors make him out to be. Before she can respond, he swings the door open, ushering her in. Upon entering, she accidentally interrupts a conversation between Rail and Orlin. Rail doesn't seem to mind, though, instead, he thanks her for her help in identifying the real culprit. He even asks if there's anything she wants in return for her services. Marie considers asking him to let her leave the Lion Palace, but something on his desk catches her eye, a report about the fire. She asks about it, and Rail reveals the culprit was Oscar. Marie is taken aback. What could have driven Oscar to do such a thing? Rail says Oscar didn't mean to ruin the party but won't say more. Suddenly, it clicks for Marie, Oscar must have been trying to perform the flame vanishing trick she taught him. The realization weighs heavy on her heart. As if reading her thoughts, Orlin brings up the topic of Oscar's punishment. He mentions the law calls for the offender's hands to be cut off, and Marie is horrified at the thought. Orlin questions Rail's hesitation to punish Oscar, reminding him that he could have killed Oscar during the Civil War. He sees this as a chance to get rid of a potential threat to Rail's claim to the throne. He argues that the majority would support this, but Rail counters that those loyal to the Emperor, like Kiel, wouldn't want to see Oscar harmed. Marie finds herself torn between the politics at play. She can't bear the thought of a child being punished so severely and decides she won't let them hurt Oscar. As Rail starts to pronounce Oscar's fate, Marie interrupts him. She asks for her reward, to take the blame for teaching Oscar the trick, thereby lessening his punishment. Rail questions whether she understands what she's asking for, but Marie stands firm. She won't abandon Oscar. Rail offers her a way out, saying she won't be blamed even if Oscar admits to copying her tricks. Despite this, Marie insists on taking responsibility. Rail is taken aback by Marie's selflessness. He can't help but feel a pang of frustration every time he sees her. After a tense silence, he finally agrees to her request. He announces Oscar will be imprisoned for two months for causing the fire and damaging property. Orlin protests, but Rail dismisses him and asks to speak with Marie privately. Marie thanks Rail, who brushes off her gratitude and reminds her she'll also be punished. Nervously, she asks what her punishment will be. Marie's heart is pounding like a drum as she waits for Rail's verdict on her punishment. But then, out of the blue, he asks her to play the piano before he makes up his mind. Marie's mind starts racing. Does he suspect that she's the pianist who played at the party? She debates sabotaging her performance, but when Rail encourages her to play without reservations, she's torn. Choosing to play it safe, she decides on a simple tune, hoping to hide her true skill level. As she starts to play, Rail finds himself drawn into the music. It's not intricate, yet there's something soothing about it. When she finishes, he opens his eyes and states, you are the pianist. Panic floods Marie as she wonders how much Rail knows. Has he figured out she helped Johannes? Rail queries why she hid her identity. Overwhelmed, Marie crumples to the floor, apologizing over and over again. Rail clarifies he's just curious, not angry, and can't quite understand why she'd go to such lengths to hide her talent. Marie, desperate to keep her secret safe, tells him she didn't want to draw attention or cause any trouble as a war prisoner. Rail can tell there's more to her story than fear of being branded a witch. He's intrigued by her, and his mind races with questions about who she really is and why she affects him so much. He wonders if he should step away from her to clear his head. Instead, he tells Marie, who is the Emperor's property, that her punishment is to be transferred from the Emperor's ownership to his own. She is now his. That night, Marie can't sleep. Rail's words keep replaying in her head, she belongs to him now. 
she feels trapped, wishing for any other fate. Imprisonment, even physical pain, seems preferable to being tied to the crown prince. She realizes she can't leave the palace until Rail picks a crown princess, which gives her an idea for an escape plan. Jane, noticing Marie's distress, asks if she's okay. Marie brushes off her concern, blaming her exhaustion. Jane, feeling indebted to Marie for saving her life, offers to help in any way she can. She asks about Marie's preparations for the upcoming masquerade ball. Marie is taken aback, she's been invited to the ball? As the ball draws nearer, the other maids swarm around Marie, eager to help her get ready. Marie tries to dissuade them, reminding them she'll be wearing a mask so there's no need for a grand transformation. But they're too excited to listen, chattering about potential suitors and the chance to spend the night outside the palace. With a sigh, Marie heads to the ballroom, thinking about how this is her first time attending a masquerade ball despite all her time in the palace. She's received three invitations, one from Kiel, which she figures is just a polite gesture, another from Johannes, the emperor himself, and a mysterious third invitation with no name attached, leaving her intrigued and waiting for an explanation that never comes. As Johannes saunters over, Marie automatically dips into a bow. But he waves it off with a grin, reminding her that at masquerade balls, they're supposed to act like they don't know each other. Marie blinks in surprise and wonders how she can pretend not to know the emperor himself. Johannes, looking dapper as ever, compliments her on her stunning appearance, which she brushes off as him just messing around. But he insists he's serious, causing her to blush slightly. Johannes reveals he was behind the mysterious third invitation and extends his hand, asking if he can escort her. Marie can't help but feel wary, she knows his charm has made many women swoon before. She wonders if this is just another game for him or if he genuinely wants to keep her company. But before she can answer, Kiel interrupts them, asking if he's the one who'll be escorting Marie. The sudden twist leaves Marie speechless. Kiel, ever the gentleman, asks if he can accompany her instead. Johannes gives him a warning look, but Kiel simply reminds him they're supposed to act like they don't know each other. Marie watches their exchange unfold, worried about drawing attention. To keep things simple, she declines both their offers, thanking them for the thought but insisting she'd feel out of place as their partner. She believes Kiel probably invited her out of kindness and hopes he finds someone more deserving. Kiel, however, disagrees. He tells her she's not inadequate but a dear friend. His sincere words convince Marie to accept his company. Johannes watches them, finding Marie even more intriguing than he initially thought. He briefly considers kidnapping her but dismisses the idea, knowing he'll see her again soon. In his thoughts, he affectionately calls her his cute maid. Meanwhile, Rail scans the crowd for Marie, wondering why he even sent her an invitation in the first place. When he finally spots her coming down the stairs, his heart skips a beat. But his joy is short-lived when he sees Kiel by her side. Marie is in awe of the lavish ball, gawking at the extravagant spread of food. She almost bumps into someone, and Kiel advises her to be careful. Overwhelmed, she admits she's not used to such grandeur. Kiel suggests they take a breather outside. On the balcony, Marie breathes a sigh of relief, confessing that fancy balls aren't really her thing. Kiel agrees, admitting he's not a fan either but thought it would be nice to attend one with her. He thanks her for taking the blame for Oscar and assures her his family will always be there for her. Marie asks about Oscar, and Kiel tells her he's doing fine and even expressed his wish to marry her someday. After their chat, Kiel asks her to dance. Despite her protests, he assures her it's a casual dance and he'll lead the way. Rail's eyes are glued to Marie and Kiel, sharing a close moment on the balcony. He can't help but wonder if there's something more between them. But he quickly squashes that thought, thinking they probably barely know each other. Orlin, ever the observant one, nudges Rail, asking him if something's up. Rail brushes it off, assuring him everything is A-OK. -okay. He then changes the topic to the newly revised luxury goods tax law, hoping to distract himself. Orlin, though, isn't easily fooled. He sneaks a glance at the balcony, wondering what's got Rail so riled up. Suddenly, Rail goes quiet when he spots Kiel and Marie dancing together. He watches them for a while, his thoughts running wild. He finally shakes himself out of it and tells Orlin he's heading into town now that the festival's wrapped up. Orlin's eyebrows shoot up when Rail confirms he'll be going incognito, but doesn't question it further. 
Hoping the fresh air will clear his mind, Rail leaves the ball. The next day, Marie, back in her usual clothes, steps out of the palace on her day off. She thinks back to the ball, still feeling like it was all a dream. She wonders what the future holds as she decides to head to the Lion Palace once her break ends. With the Crown Princess selection looming, she's got plans to help one of the candidates get picked. And once that's done, she'll ask to be reassigned to another palace. Marie's confident that her unique skills will be the secret weapon for the candidate she supports. She's hoping to make a powerful ally in the future princess and eventually earn her freedom. Even though she's still puzzled why Rail claimed her as his property, she's sure he'll forget about her in time. And that'll be her chance to slip away before anyone realizes she's Marina. Giving herself a mental pep talk, she heads into town, where the festival is still going strong. As she takes in the sights and sounds of the bustling festival, Marie can't help but compare it to the ones back home. It's on another level here, full of life and joy. And even though the war ended less than a year ago, there's no trace of sadness on people's faces. She figures they have Rail to thank for that. Despite his flaws, he's shown kindness to his people. Back at the Lion Palace, Rail is getting ready to head into town. He ditches his mask and slips into ordinary clothes, hoping to blend in with the crowd. Almond frowns, worried about Rail going alone. But Rail brushes off his concerns, assuring him that nothing will happen to him in his own empire. Once in town, Rail strolls around, hoping the fresh air will clear his mind. Meanwhile, Marie wanders through the lively streets, window shopping but not buying anything. She stumbles upon a group of kids gathered around a piano and realizes the white keys aren't working. So, she sits down and starts playing a melody using only the black keys. The crowd loves it, clapping along to the rhythm. Some guys are amazed by the piano's sudden recovery, and Rail, who happens to be nearby, explains how Marie's only using the black keys. As she wraps up her performance, the crowd bursts into applause. Beaming, Marie continues exploring the town, thinking about how much fun she had playing the piano and the tips she made. She even considers becoming a pianist once she's free from palace life. Out of nowhere, a scruffy-looking dude sidles up to Marie, flashing a pocket knife and whispering for her to follow him. Marie freezes, heart-pounding as she weighs her options. Meanwhile, Rail is desperately scanning the crowd, trying to spot the maid he'd been tailing from a distance. He'd had a bad feeling about a group of shady characters he'd noticed earlier. Seeing one of them trying to kidnap Marie, he springs into action. In a flash, Rail decks the guy holding Marie, sending both of them sprawling. As the dust settles, Rail squares off against the remaining thugs, giving them a choice they could either choke on their own tongues or deal with him. The men wisely opt for surrender, and Rail quickly ties them up and flags down a passing guard. Marie thanks him, but he brushes it off, though inside, he's seething and vowing to look into the lax security. Marie, who'd initially thought her rescuer was just some servant, is taken aback by his skill with a sword. She can't believe that the stern, intimidating man from the Swan Garden came to her rescue. She thanks him again and offers to repay his kindness, even though she doesn't have much. When she asks if there's anything he needs, Rail, who had hoped she'd just go back to the palace and rest, thinks for a moment before making an unexpected request for her to come along with him. Marie, though confused, agrees. He suggests she call him Ran. When they arrive at their destination, a fancy hospital used by the nobility Marie is surprised. She asks if he needs medicine and offers to wait outside, but he tells her the visit is for her, not him. He wants her facial wound treated. She tries to wave it off, saying it will heal on its own, but he insists, admitting he doesn't like seeing her hurt. Inside, the receptionist almost calls Rail by his title but catches herself in time. When she asks who Marie is, Rail seems surprised. The receptionist peppers them with questions about Marie's noble lineage and personal details, causing Marie to wonder if she's really a receptionist or a spy. But she treats Marie's wounds without further questions, while Rail watches silently. As they leave, Rail tells Marie to let him know if she's in any pain. She wonders if he's genuinely concerned or if this is just how he treats people. As she thanks him for his concern, she notices him mouthing her words, as if trying to figure out why he's so worried about her. He awkwardly thanks her for the snacks she made earlier, then walks away. Later, they sit by a fountain, sipping drinks that Rail bought. Marie remembers him buying the orange juice, 
and how the vendor had called him handsome. She thanks him for his generosity and asks if he needs to get back to work, just as a child trips and falls nearby. Marie rushes over to help, while Rail realizes he'd made up an excuse about having business to attend to and wonders what he should say next. After making sure the little kid was okay, Rail breaks into a grin. Today, he says, I'm on a mission to spend money. And you're my partner in crime. He tells Marie not to worry about the cost and to stick with him. Inside, he's berating himself for not being smooth, calling himself an idiot. Marie chuckles, promising to help him complete his mission. She thinks he's just being shy and could have simply asked her to hang out. They continue their stroll, hitting up all the spots Marie had been eyeing. Rail spoils her rotten, buying her everything from trinkets to treats. At one point, they spot a snack stand. Rail suggests they each get something, but Marie insists on paying this time. She feels like she's taken enough from him and wants to return the favor. As the day winds down, Marie realizes she has to prepare for her new job at the Lion Palace tomorrow. The thought dampens her spirits, and Rail, picking up on her mood, offers to walk her back. Suddenly, it starts pouring like there's no tomorrow. They scramble for cover, ending up in an empty church. Marie hesitates, worried they might get kicked out, but Rail reassures her that churches are meant to provide shelter. He takes off his cloak and drapes it around her, making sure she doesn't catch a cold. His kindness leaves her wondering if there's more to him than meets the eye. As they wait for the rain to stop, Marie opens up about her childhood fear of rainstorms. She shares how she used to worry that her mom, who sold goods on the streets, wouldn't come home. Rail listens attentively, asking about her mom. Marie describes her as a strong woman who never let life's struggles show. Apologizing for the sad story, she thanks him for the wonderful day. In response, Rail walks over to the piano. He admits he's not as good as her but asks her to listen. As his fingers glide over the keys, Marie is spellbound. The melody brings back memories of her childhood fears, and she wonders if he's experienced the same pain. When he finishes playing, Rail asks her to join him. He suggests that playing music might help her relax. She eagerly agrees, and they play a beautiful duet, bonding over their shared love for music. The next day, Marie packs her bags for the Lion Palace. Her friend, Jane, is sad to see her go but excited about her promotion to a mid-ranked maid. Marie, though, isn't as thrilled. She views the palace as a death trap and plans to win the favor of the crown princess candidate to escape. After saying their tearful goodbyes, Marie sets off. At the Lion Palace, the headmaid looks her over, wondering why the crown prince chose her. Before Marie can explain, the headmaid starts listing her duties. Marie's heart sinks when she hears she'll be taking turns attending to the crown prince, her worst nightmare. In this new role, Marie has to tread lightly, making sure she doesn't step on any toes or mess up. It's like walking on eggshells, with no room for screw-ups. Marie asks the headmaid if the crown prince doesn't have his own personal maid. The woman shakes her head, explaining that despite her many suggestions, the prince has always waved off the idea, finding it more of a bother than a convenience. She reckons he hasn't found a maid who suits his taste yet but hints that things might change soon. And as she glances at Marie, the latter can't help but feel a chill down her spine. Before she rushes off to prep for the crown princess candidates, the headmaid introduces Marie to Lesia, who will show her the ropes. Lesia takes Marie on a grand tour of the Lion Palace, introducing her to the other staff members they bump into. To Marie's surprise, everyone is super friendly, which confuses her. After biting her tongue for so long, she finally asks Lesia why everyone's being so nice to her. Lesia looks puzzled, so Marie explains how people usually give her the cold shoulder because of her lowly background. Lesia lets out a chuckle, explaining that it's all thanks to the prince. Apparently, him choosing an ordinary girl like Marie to work at the Lion Palace has made her somewhat of a celebrity among the staff. Lesia adds that the prince must think Marie's got something special. Even though the maids don't know the specifics, they're not keen to cross the prince, who can be quite scary when he's mad. After the tour, Lesia shows Marie to her room. Sitting on her new bed after Lesia leaves, Marie mulls over what she said. The prince thinks she's special? She remembers him saying this job was her punishment, which had scared her. But now, she feels somewhat at ease. 
the work doesn't seem as tough as she thought and tomorrow, she'll start serving the prince. That night, Marie has a strange dream. In it, a girl named Yun Mei serves her brother a cup of white tea from Fujian. Her brother says the tea helps him forget his worries. Intrigued, Marie asks how Yun Mei brews it. She replies that if your heart is true and sincere, it shows in what you do. She just tries her best. Waking up with a start, Marie's mind is still on the dream and the tea. In the next scene, we see Marie carrying a tray of tea, heading to the crown prince's room. A mix of excitement and nerves swirls inside her, but she reminds herself to stay cool. She knocks on the door and introduces herself, asking for permission to come in. Amon's voice responds from inside, allowing her to enter. As she walks in, she greets him and offers the refreshments. She tells him to let her know if he needs anything, then retreats to a corner of the room, waiting silently. The prince seems busy with some papers, barely acknowledging Marie. But then he looks up and surprises her by asking if her legs hurt. Caught off guard, she asks if he's talking to her. He confirms he is, and even though she assures him she's fine, he insists she sit down. Confused, she asks if he's sure, worried about breaking the rules of standing in front of the crown prince. Rail, with a smirk on his face, turns to Amund and says, Hey, is there some sort of no-sitting rule for maids in the prince's presence? Amund, caught off guard, admits he doesn't recall any such regulation. Rail chuckles, suggesting maybe it's not in the official palace rulebook. Marie can't believe what she's hearing. She's positive it's one of those unspoken rules everyone just knows. She wonders if they're messing with her. But then, Rail throws her for another loop. He states that his word is law here, and orders her to sit down. Still in disbelief, Marie thanks Amund as he helps her take a seat. As she settles in, her attention shifts to the prince. She notices him working away, having only eaten a slice of bread. Concerned, she wonders if he's overworking himself. Suddenly, Rail looks up at her, and she quickly asks if there's anything else she can do for him. His response surprises her. He tells her she hasn't had a proper meal because of attending to him, and suggests she should take a break. Marie thanks him and leaves, but can't shake off this weird sense of deja vu. While she's gone, Amon notices Rail clutching his head and asks if he's okay. Rail brushes it off, saying it's nothing to worry about. After a while, Marie returns, only to find Amund is no longer in the room. As if reading her mind, Rail informs her that Amund was called away due to some royal guard business and will be gone for a while. Panic sets in for Marie as she realizes she'll be alone with the prince. As time passes, Rail engrosses himself in his work while Marie tries to stay awake. But watching him work so peacefully makes her drowsy. She chides herself, reminding herself she can't fall asleep in front of the prince. But despite her best efforts, she eventually dozes off. Noticing her sleeping, Rail softly says her name, acknowledging she must be really tired. He wonders aloud what to do with her. Then, in a surprising move, he kneels down in front of her and asks if she knows how much she distracts him. He reaches out to touch her face but stops himself, questioning his actions. He decides he can't work like this and leaves to get some air. When Marie wakes up, she freaks out, realizing she fell asleep on the job. She berates herself for her mistake and is surprised to find a blanket covering her. As she's trying to make sense of it, Amon's voice startles her. He asks if she's awake and comments on how tired she must have been. Marie starts apologizing, but Amon dismisses her concerns, explaining that the prince wasn't in the office anyway. He advises her to rest for the day. When she tries to object, saying she can't leave until the prince does, Amon shares a piece of news she wasn't aware of, the prince suffers from insomnia and won't go to bed for a while, so she doesn't need to wait up for him. Marie thanks Amon for the blanket, but he seems confused, claiming he didn't cover her. Confused, Marie wonders who else could have done it. Her mind involuntarily goes to one person, but she quickly dismisses the idea, convinced it couldn't be true. The break of dawn splashes its golden hues over the palace as Marie and Lesia kickstart their day in the snug employee dining room. Amidst the clinking silverware and delightful chatter, Marie's curiosity gets the better of her. She nudges Lesia, inquiring about the contenders for the coveted crown princess position. Lesia, mid-bite into her toast, nods and spills the beans the competition is between Ariel, the Grand Sullian's tribute, and Rachel, 
Count Istvan's daughter. Marie's mind kicks into overdrive. Grand Duke Sullian and the Crown Prince are tight-knit buddies, while Count Istvan had been against the prince during the Civil War. Both families pack a punch with power, leaving Marie to wonder who the prince will favor. Lesia tosses in her two cents, guessing that Ariel has the upper hand. Ariel, backed by the mighty Grand Duke Sullian, hails from one of the Empire's top-tier aristocratic families. It's no shocker that she's everyone's bet for the Crown Princess gig. Aligning with someone like the Grand Duke would be a win-win for the Empire. But Count Istvan's sway over the first prince is no small matter either. Marie then starts wondering about the prince's personal feelings. The candidates have been chosen for political gains, but what if the prince decides to follow his heart? With the political clout of both families being neck and neck, she thinks he might choose someone he resonates with. Marie gears up to play matchmaker, vowing to help one of the candidates win his heart, even though the idea of the prince falling in love seems far-fetched. Sensing Marie's brewing excitement, Lesia asks about her experience serving the prince. Marie admits that apart from the constant jitters of getting caught, it's been pretty chill. This catches Lesia off guard, who confesses that she's always been petrified of serving the prince. The guy hasn't uttered a word to her and just being near him still gives her the heebie-jeebies. Marie recalls how even the guys dropping off documents seemed on edge around the prince. Lesia then drops a bombshell, the prince is an angel in disguise. Marie can't believe her ears. She always thought he wore a mask to hide some deformity. But Lesia sets her straight, explaining that there are other reasons for his masked appearance. Apparently, he even strolls around without his mask sometimes, which would definitely throw Marie for a loop. Lesia gushes about the prince's divine good looks, comparing him to a work of art. If there were a beauty pageant in the empire, he'd be the undisputed king. This revelation leaves Marie scratching her head, wondering why he'd hide such a face. Later, during a tea break with another maid, Marie gets the lowdown on her night shift duties with the prince. The maid warns her to tread lightly when the prince is asleep due to his severe insomnia. He probably hasn't slept in days, and when he does manage to snooze, nightmares jerk him awake. Marie had always seen the prince as a stone-cold figure, but now she grasps the depth of his struggle with sleeplessness. Just as she's lost in thought, the summoning bell jolts her back to reality. She's being called. As she steps into the prince's chamber, he seems taken aback to see her as the night shift maid. He asks for more ink and paper, making Marie realize that he is a relentless workaholic. Taking a deep breath, Marie implores Rail to prioritize his health over work. To her surprise, he doesn't brush her off. Instead, he calmly explains his reasons for burning the candle at both ends. His dedication to his duties and his people is commendable, and it leaves Marie with a newfound respect for him. Rail then surprises Marie further by showing a kinder side of him that she hadn't seen before. He expresses gratitude for her concern and the tea she's prepared, making her feel appreciated. This unexpected warmth from Rail makes Marie re-evaluate her initial impressions of him. Feeling encouraged by Rail's kindness, Marie finds herself wanting to do more for the Empire. Rail supports this sentiment, urging her to use her abilities to benefit the Empire. His faith in her abilities boosts her self-esteem and motivates her to contribute more effectively to her job. Amidst all this, Orlin bursts into the scene, brimming with excitement about a candidate's arrival. However, his enthusiasm is met with indifference from Rail. It's clear that Rail isn't as invested in the selection process as Orlin is. He's more focused on the political implications of the selection rather than personal preferences. Orlin, realizing that he hasn't been able to find Princess Marina, apologizes to Rail and suggests giving up the search. This leaves a somber mood in the room, a stark contrast to the excitement that was present just moments ago. Meanwhile, outside the palace, the Delfinas arrive. Their presence stirs up a flurry of excitement and speculation among the staff. Marie, despite being caught up in the excitement, takes a moment to contemplate who she should support. She's torn between the two candidates, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. As Marie observes the interactions between Rail and the Delfinas, she can't help but worry. She doesn't want Rail's heart to waver because of the candidates. She reassures herself that once her mission is complete, she can leave the palace without any regrets. In the end, Marie resolves to put her best foot forward during her night shifts with Rail. She's determined to do her part in ensuring a smooth selection process, 
while also taking care of Rail's needs. She hopes that her efforts will not only help the Empire but also make her time at the palace worthwhile. Later in the day, Matilda, a seasoned lady-in-waiting for Ariel, swings by Marie's quarters. She's there to pass on a message Ariel wants a chit-chat with Marie. Matilda slips in a word of caution, reminding Marie of her delicate status. She's not noble, not commoner, but a war captive. High stakes, right? Stepping into Ariel's chambers, Marie greets her with respect, and Ariel jumps straight into the interrogation. She's curious about Marie's roots, whether she's an aristocrat fallen from grace or a commoner. Marie spills the beans, revealing her prisoner of war status. Ariel, intrigued, wonders if that makes Marie a slave. Matilda steps in, clarifying that POWs aren't slaves, but Ariel can't see the difference. Shifting gears, Ariel confesses the real reason why she summoned Marie. Word on the street is that the prince, her soon-to-be hubby, has taken a liking to Marie. Ariel is curious about what makes Marie tick, but she assures Marie that the prince won't ever choose her as a concubine. This dismissive attitude irks Marie, who retorts that the prince doesn't see her like that. But Ariel simply waves her off, claiming she's done her homework. Fuming, Marie exits Ariel's chambers. She reminds herself to keep her cool, knowing that losing her temper would only make things worse. She also believes that Ariel's snooty attitude won't win the prince's heart. Still, she's not ready to throw in the towel. She decides she needs to meet Rachel and knows it's possible because the maids serve both palaces. So, she waits patiently for her chance. Surprisingly, her chance comes sooner than expected. Gina, Rachel's maid, pops by with a message, Rachel wants to see her. Rachel greets Marie warmly and offers her a seat. Nervous, Marie accepts the offer. Despite Marie's initial refusal, Rachel insists on serving her tea and asks Gina to prepare it. As Gina returns with the tea and sweet treats, Marie wonders why Rachel summoned her. After a while, Rachel reveals that she needs a favor. She wants Marie's help for her and Count Istvan. Confused, Marie wonders how she, just a maid, could help. Rachel explains that she needs to win the prince's hand in marriage to save her family's future. The Istvan family has been on a downward spiral since their defeat in the Civil War. Rachel believes that becoming the crown princess is the only way to turn things around. But Ariel is the front runner, so she begs Marie to help her win. Marie agrees to help Rachel get closer to the prince. Rachel appreciates it but is more interested in Marie's special skills. She's heard about Marie's remarkable abilities, which the prince values. Rachel wants Marie to help her navigate the selection process using her knowledge and promises to grant Marie anything she wants in return. That night, Marie mulls over Rachel's offer. It aligns with her plan, and she can't find fault with Rachel's character. Plus, she believes Rachel would make a good crown princess. Rachel's promises of a new identity, safe passage out of the country, and a 1,000 painter reward are tempting. Marie wonders if she could help fulfill Rachel's desires while sticking to her original plan. She figures that if she helps Rachel from behind the scenes, the girl will be in the spotlight, and Marie can fly under the radar. If Rachel becomes the crown princess, Marie can exit stage left without a fuss. It's a win-win plan. Next day, Rail summons Echelon to his office. He's not thrilled about Marie becoming Rachel's exclusive maid. He's like, hey, Marie is my personal aid. What gives? Echelon explains that Rachel requested it. Rail's like, cool, as long as she's not tied down to anyone. In the following days, Marie is juggling her duties like a pro. Afternoons are for Rachel, and nights are for helping Rail catch some Zs. But she's noticed that Rail and the candidates aren't really getting a chance to hang out outside of official events. She wonders if she should play Cupid and create an opportunity for them to get to know each other. One day, Marie is doing Rachel's hair, and Rachel is all praises for Marie's hairstyling skills. Marie credits it to Rachel's gorgeous hair. Marie then remembers a dream she had, but the details are hazy. After wrapping up the hairstyling session, they head to breakfast it's a grand feast to celebrate the candidate's arrival. Marie crosses her fingers for a smooth event. But nope, they reach the dining room only to find out there's another banquet happening. Rachel suggests they take a stroll in the garden instead. 
As they walk, Marie notices how relaxed and happy Rachel seems, reminding her of a regular girl her age. Suddenly, they hear Ariel's voice. Enter the drama queen. Ariel and Rachel exchange pleasantries, and Ariel throws some shade at Rachel, advising her to enjoy the beauty while she still can. Rachel thanks Ariel, but Marie is not impressed with Ariel's pettiness. Ariel then takes a jab at Marie, calling her a war prisoner from a ruined nation. Rachel jumps to Marie's defense, pointing out that even the crown prince acknowledges Marie's skills. She warns Ariel that her words could disgrace the prince, and Ariel backpedals. Rachel insists on an apology from Ariel, and a sheepish Ariel says sorry to Marie. In that moment, Marie realizes that Rachel is no pushover. Later, Rachel mentions the selection banquet happening that night, and Ariel's curiosity is piqued. Ariel hints at a surprise gift for Rachel and leaves them hanging. As Ariel walks away, Marie can't shake off a feeling of unease. She's sure Ariel is up to no good. Back in Rachel's room, Marie checks on the progress of Rachel's dress for the banquet. Rachel assures her it's all going well. But Marie can't shake off Ariel's words and shares her worries with Rachel. They both hope that everything goes smoothly at the banquet. Marie, ever the problem solver, starts to suspect Ariel might have messed with Rachel's dress. She suggests they check on it just to be safe. So, Rachel sends Gina on a recon mission to check out the dress situation. Just as Marie predicted, Gina comes back with bad news the dress won't be ready for the banquet due to some material issues. Rachel's bummed out that store is top-notch in the capital, and it's highly unlikely they would screw up like this. Marie asks Rachel if she has any other dresses, but Rachel admits her wardrobe is out of style by the capital's standards. Marie's mind starts racing, their only option is to DIY the dress. But she's not exactly a fashion designer, so what's next? Then, she has a light bulb moment, she recalls a snippet from her dream. Rachel notices Marie lost in thought and asks if she's got a plan. Marie confidently says she's got it covered and tells them to bring the dress to her. As the banquet kicks off, everyone's buzzing about the crown princess candidates. Ariel makes her grand entrance, and the guests are wowed by her beauty, she's like a shooting star lighting up the night sky. Ariel's feeling pretty smug, convinced that Rachel's late entrance in outdated attire will be a letdown after her own dazzling appearance. In Ariel's mind, this is her night, and Rachel's just a supporting act. Then Rachel enters the room, and Ariel nearly chokes on her wine. Rachel is stunning in her dress, and the guests can't stop gushing about her, comparing her to a fairy. Ariel is seething. Where on earth did Rachel get that killer outfit? When Rail finally arrives, both girls greet him, but he seems to be more interested in Rachel's dress than Rachel herself. The guests are quick to pick up on this, they know the prince isn't a fan of flashy clothes, so his interest in Rachel's dress is intriguing. Rail takes Ariel for the first dance, and while the guests are impressed by their moves, they can sense some tension. After that dance, it's Rachel's turn. As she glides along with Rail, she reminds herself that this is just the beginning, and there are more challenges ahead. Rail's curious about who designed Rachel's dress. Rachel seizes the moment to share her thoughts. She tells him that she's uncomfortable with splurging on dresses funded by taxpayer money, which is why she went with a simpler design. When Rail asks again who designed the dress, Rachel claims she did it herself. Rail looks skeptical but doesn't push further. After the banquet, Rail retreats to his chambers, where Marie is waiting. She offers him tea, but he's not thirsty. Instead, he asks her to play the piano. As he lies in bed, hidden behind a curtain, he thanks Marie for her hard work. Marie wonders if he knows about her role in Rachel's dress. As Marie plays the piano, Rail finds comfort in her music. He ponders about her presence and what it means for him. Rail finds himself in a bit of a pickle. He's gotten used to having Marie around for tea and tunes, but he's not so sure if that's okay. He can't help but worry about her, which is totally out of character for him. He's the big boss of the Empire, after all, he's got bigger fish to fry. But he can't shake off this nagging feeling. He's supposed to be all about the iron, getting his hands dirty with the blood of his enemies. But here he is, fretting over his maid. Meanwhile, Rachel's got her own problems. She wants to get some snacks for the prince, but the bakery's all sorry, we've got an emergency. Rachel's bummed, she really wanted those snacks. 
But then she has a brainwave, why not make the snacks herself? There's just one tiny problem, she's a total newbie in the kitchen. To make matters worse, Ariel's been acting frosty ever since the banquet. It doesn't help that Rachel caught Ariel confessing that she tried to embarrass her. Talk about drama! Rachel's running out of time, she needs to get those snacks before her 2pm meeting with the prince. She tries to find another bakery, but no luck. She suspects Ariel might have snagged the best baker in town. She asks the maids if they can bake, but they're clueless. Just when all hope seems lost, Marie steps up and offers to bake the snacks. Rachel's over the moon, she calls Marie her guardian angel. So, Rachel meets Rail at 2pm, and they chat about this and that, the weather, the fall leaves. Suddenly, Rail asks about Marie, catching Rachel off guard. She tells him Marie's running an errand. Then the snacks arrive, and Rail's got a hunch that they're Marie's handiwork. Rachel admits she's not much of a baker and hopes he likes the snacks. Rail takes a bite and loves it. He asks Rachel if she made them herself, and she says yes. But Rail's not convinced and asks her again. Meanwhile, Marie's enjoying some me time in the palace gardens. She's a little worried about Rachel but figures the girl can handle herself. She thinks about going into town, but she doesn't have a ride, and she needs to be back before sundown. So she decides to hang out in the palace. Marie finds a cozy bench and starts reminiscing. She wonders if she still has her special abilities and thinks about the sick prisoner who prayed for her. She remembers the scary incident with the three men and how Ran saved her. She hopes to see him again someday. Marie takes a moment to reflect on her current situation. She realizes that she still has her special abilities, which means there are more people out there who might need her help. She's still pretty good at cooking and playing music, but she's noticed that her cleaning skills aren't what they used to be. This gets her thinking about her future, what kind of life does she want to live? She decides that she needs to make a clean break from the palace. It's not that she hates the crown prince or anything, she just doesn't want to risk getting caught up in any royal drama. Her plan is to find a quiet spot far away from the empire where she can live a simple life helping others. While she's lost in thought, Kiel comes by for a visit. She instinctively calls him your grace, but he corrects her it's just Kiel when they're alone. They chat for a bit, and Marie asks if anything interesting has happened recently. Kiel says it's been quiet, but he admits that he's missed seeing her around. He even gives her a cheeky wink, which makes Marie blush. Marie's curious about why Kiel's hanging out in the palace, so he explains that he works there. He tells her that they're actually in the Jun Palace, home to Emperor Thorn too. Kiel's job is to guard the Emperor, but he mostly handles external affairs while his vice-captain does the actual guarding. Marie's surprised by this revelation, she'd forgotten that Kiel was the head of the Imperial Bodyguard and a Margrave responsible for protecting the northern part of the Empire. He's been loyal to the unconscious Emperor, despite facing opposition from the Crown Prince. Kiel's family, the Setons, have stayed neutral during the ongoing power struggle among the princes. They refuse to recognize anyone other than the Emperor as the rightful ruler, a stance that has put them at odds with the Crown Prince. Kiel asks Marie if she's been having any trouble with Rachel, Ariel, or the Crown Prince. Marie assures him that everyone's been nice to her. Kiel tells her to let him know if anyone gives her a hard time or if she runs into any issues. Marie suggests that Kiel should get back to work, but he confesses that he usually leaves most of the heavy lifting to his vice-captain. They share a laugh about this, and Marie admits that she enjoys spending time with him. Kiel says the feeling is mutual. Later, Kiel takes Marie to a fancy restaurant because he's worried about her eating habits. The staff there know Kiel well and are curious about who Marie is. Before Marie can introduce herself, Kiel tells them that she's someone very important to him. Marie assumes he's just being friendly, but the staff treats her like royalty. Marie's a bit overwhelmed by the fancy surroundings and wonders if she really belongs there. Kiel notices her discomfort and asks if she's okay. She assures him she's fine, but Kiel apologizes for possibly overdoing it with the fancy restaurant. He just wanted their first meal together to be special. Marie tells him not to worry, she's not uncomfortable, just a little out of her element. Before long, the first course hits the table, and Marie makes a mental note to really enjoy this meal. After all, Kiel went through all this trouble just for her. 
They chat away as they eat, and once they finish, they settle back with some tea and talk about Kiel's job. He explains that his captain gig is more of a title than anything else, and his real job is playing border patrol up north. Right now, he's hanging out with the royals because things are pretty chill on the border front. Kiel tells Marie about the Marquis territory, it's a bit of a wild west situation, but the people are nice, and the views are to die for. He even asks if she'd like to visit sometime. Marie's intrigued, she's been thinking of exploring the Marquis territory when she finally leaves the palace, so this could be a good opportunity. After their meal, they say their goodbyes, and Marie admits she had a great time. On the ride back, Kiel warns Marie about Rachel. He doesn't give her any specifics, just a vague be careful. Marie's not sure what to make of this, but she appreciates his concern. She promises to let him know if anything goes down, and he reminds her that she doesn't have to deal with everything on her own. Back at the palace, Rail's busy dealing with council stuff. They're all worked up about some Eastern Holy Nation folks coming to town. Some council members want to kick them out, calling them names and stuff, but Orlin thinks they should hear them out. Rail agrees with Orlin, but he's got a problem who's going to play host? The usual suspects are MIA, and he can't do it himself without causing a ruckus. Meanwhile, Ariel's having a meltdown. She's sick of Rachel making her look bad, and she's about ready to throw in the towel. But then one of her maids comes in with some news, the Eastern Halidom delegation is on their way. Ariel sees this as her chance to shine and vows to knock it out of the park. Rachel's worried about Ariel stealing the show, so she talks to Marie about it. They both agree that it would be bad if Ariel nails this one. Marie's secretly hoping Ariel screws up, but she knows this is a big deal for the country. She wonders if Ariel can pull off the whole gracious host thing, considering the cultural differences between the Western countries and the Eastern Halidom. She hopes Ariel remembers not to serve pork, that would be a disaster. So, Kazan, the head honcho of the Eastern delegation, rolls up to the palace on horseback with his crew in tow. He's got this I'm too good for this place vibe going on, and he's clearly itching to get back home. Count Gilbert is there to welcome them, and Kazan introduces himself as the Sultan's right-hand man. He's excited to meet the Crown Prince, but he's also a little on edge. While he's waiting to see the Prince, Kazan decides to take a soak in one of the palace's fancy tubs. He's pleasantly surprised by the royal treatment he's getting. After his bath, his maid tells him about the welcome banquet Ariel's throwing for him, and Kazan's all for it. At the banquet, Ariel introduces herself to Kazan, and he compliments her on her looks. He's looking forward to enjoying dinner with her, but when he sees what's for dinner, a calf steak, he loses it. He accuses Ariel of disrespecting him and his people by serving them haram food. This is a big no-no for Kazan, and he vows that his people will never forget this insult. Orlin rushes to tell Rail about the fiasco at the banquet, and Rail's not amused. He grumbles about the delegates stirring up trouble when they're the ones who wanted to come here in the first place. Orlin explains that Kazan was upset because the calf wasn't slaughtered according to the Dabiha method. This technique involves facing the animal towards its holy place and cutting out the esophagus, airway, veins, and arteries in one swift motion to drain the blood. The Haladim's people strictly follow this ritual and won't eat meat that hasn't been properly prepared. Rail asks about Kazan's reaction, and Orlin tells him that Kazan has decided to fast until he gets food that's been prepared according to his religious customs. Orlin doesn't think Kazan will talk about why he's here until his demands are met, and this irritates Rail. He realizes the importance of the Haladim sending an official delegate for the first time and knows he can't just kick them out without hearing them out. But he also doesn't want to give in to their unreasonable demands. Rail wonders if there's a way to smooth things over without giving in, and Marie pops into his mind. Rail doesn't think Marie or Rachel can handle this situation, so he decides to tackle it himself. But just as he's about to leave to meet with some merchants who know a thing or two about the Eastern Halidom, someone tells him that Rachel's here and she claims to have a solution. Rail tells them to tell Rachel he's busy, but Rachel insists she can fix this mess. When Rachel hears about the banquet disaster, she thinks it's hilarious that Ariel was the one who had to deal with the delegates first. She didn't know about their strict dietary rules, and now she's in hot water. Marie asks Rachel if she has a plan, and although Rachel admits she doesn't, Marie says she might have an idea. Rail lets Rachel come into his office to share her suggestion. She thinks they should whip up a feast without any meat. 
Orlin's skeptical, a meal with just fruits and veggies might not go over well. But Rachel mentions Marie's suggestion to serve scaly fish, which is allowed in the Eastern Halidom's religion. Rachel explains this to Rael and Orlin, and Orlin wonders if the meal would be subpar with just fish and veggies. Rachel remembers Marie saying that this is their problem, not ours, and we don't need to bend over backwards for the Eastern Halidom. Rail gives Rachel a thumbs up for her brilliant idea and tells her she's pretty smart. Rachel just shrugs, but Rail insists on knowing how she knew about the Halidom's dietary rules. Rachel says she read about it in a book called The Life of Pagans by Baron Dorain. Rail's impressed by Rachel's book smarts and thinks Marie's rubbed off on her. Once Rachel leaves, Orlin tells Rail he's lucky to have such a brainy maid. Rail agrees, but he can't help thinking about how he found that same book in the library of the conquered Clown Kingdom. He wonders why Rachel was interested in such an oddball topic and why Marie's always the one who comes to mind. Rachel's fish and veggies banquet is a hit with the court members, and even Kazan seems to enjoy it. The court chief and the foreign affairs minister praise Rachel's wisdom, causing her status to rise. Ariel doesn't like this one bit, but Rail doesn't seem to care. Meanwhile, Marie's thinking about how to get the prince to warm up to Rachel. The next day, Kazan finally meets with Rail and spills the beans, the Eastern Halidom's been hit by a drought, and they need food. The council members flip out, telling Rail to send Kazan packing. But Kazan warns them that refusing to help could lead to war, and he promises to return the favor if the Empire ever needs help. He points out their surplus food stores, which are starting to spoil and attract bugs. The ladies of the court are all abuzz about the possibility of war. They're worried about the safety of the palace and whether the crown prince can protect it. Marie overhears their conversation and realizes how serious things are. She feels bad for the prince, who's been having trouble sleeping. Later that night, Marie decides to check on the prince. But Amon tells her that Rail's still in his office and asks Marie to make him some tea for his headache. When Marie knocks on Rail's office door, he quickly puts on his face mask. She hands him the tea and suggests he take a break. Rail insists he's fine and thanks her for the tea, telling her to go get some sleep. But Marie asks if she can speak her mind, and Rail encourages her to do so. Feeling confident, Marie proposes a solution to Rail, why not sell food to the Halidom? They could avoid war and make some money. Rail says he thought about it but didn't think it would work because of the Empire's religious rules. Marie suggests other trade items, but Rail says those are off-limits too. Marie apologizes for the bad idea, but Rail reassures her that it was a good suggestion. He encourages her to keep sharing her ideas with him. After her chat with Rail, Marie heads out of his office, her mind buzzing with thoughts. She's trying to come up with a trade solution that fits within the Empire's religious restrictions, but she's drawing a blank. That night, as she sleeps, she dreams about two people speaking in the old imperial language. They're talking about their homeland in the southwest, which has had a bad harvest while other regions thrive. They're worried about running out of food and the prince not sending them enough supplies. Marie watches as the man struggles to find a way out of the mess. The next day, while tidying up Rachel's room, Marie can't help but think about her dream. She places a piece of cake in front of Rachel and wonders if the dream is somehow related to the Halidom situation. Rachel asks Marie what's on her mind, and Marie tells her about her musings. Rachel doesn't seem too interested, though. She just says they need to deal with the Halidom soon so she can focus on becoming the crown princess. She asks Marie if she's found a solution yet, and Marie admits she hasn't. Rachel then reminds Marie to let her know first if she comes up with something good. As they chat, Rachel munches on her cake, and suddenly, Marie gets an idea. Marie thinks about how sugar is a luxury item and wonders if it could be used for trade. But then she remembers that sugar is also a taboo item. Rachel comments on how nice it would be if they could grow their own sugar in the empire, and this sparks another thought in Marie's mind. She imagines getting sugarcane seeds and growing sugar right here in the empire. She knows the climate isn't ideal for sugarcane, except in the southwest where it's hot and rainy. Marie gets excited thinking about the empire selling sugar to other countries and making big bucks. She decides to tell the prince about her idea, she's sure he'll be thrilled. But just as she's about to spill the beans, Rachel interrupts and asks if Marie's come up with something. She urges Marie to share so she can take the credit. But Marie stays quiet, knowing that her idea could be a game-changer. 
Rachel and Marie head to the dining room for lunch with Rail and Ariel. On the way, Rachel greets Ariel, but Ariel just snubs her. Rachel thinks she knows why the prince values her, because of all the things Marie's done for her, like the dress and the snacks. She wonders if she should keep Marie around once she becomes the crown princess, but she decides it's better to cut ties with Marie once she gets the crown. Rail shows up late for lunch and asks for the food to be served ASAP because he's in a hurry. He tells Rachel to go ahead and say what she wants to say, and Rachel thinks this is her chance to win him over. Ariel shoots Rachel a dirty look as Rachel starts talking about the Halidom's demands and presents Marie's idea as her own. Rail seems impressed, and Ariel realizes the competition might be over. Just as Rachel's about to accept the praise, Rail angrily asks where she got the idea. Rachel tries to claim it was her idea, but Rail cuts her off and asks if she really came up with it. Rachel insists it was her idea and reminds herself to stay calm after all, only she knows that Marie was the brains behind it. Rail then asks how they'd deal with potential backlash from other countries if they decided to help the Halidom with food aid. Rachel starts rambling about sugarcane seeds, but Rail interrupts her and repeats his question. Rachel starts panicking and wishes Marie would step in with an answer. Marie's got the right answer, but how to spill it has her stumped. She glances at Rail, and for a split second, their eyes meet, causing her to quickly look away. Rachel, meanwhile, is suggesting they take the we're too powerful to care approach. Rail cuts in, explaining that going down that road would essentially brand them as pagans, stirring up a whole lot of trouble. He can't believe Rachel would propose such a thing without thinking it through. Rail then asks Rachel if she just woke up with this brilliant idea. Rachel tries to assure him that she didn't mean to deceive him, but Rail isn't buying it. He reminds her that this isn't the first time she's tried to pull a fast one. He tells everyone to scram, except for Marie, whom he asks to stick around. The two of them head to the balcony, where Rail offers Marie a seat. At first, she refuses, but eventually, she settles down. A maid brings in some snacks while Rail grills Marie about her involvement in Rachel's scheme. Marie gets on her knees, begging for forgiveness. Rail tells her it's cool, but he's confused about why she's helping Rachel. He advises her to come to him if she ever faces trouble, emphasizing that no one else should be trusted. Rail admits that Marie's idea was pretty awesome, but there are still some hurdles to overcome. Marie then drops the bombshell, they can avoid backlash by involving a third party. They would sell the food to this intermediary, who would then trade with the pagans. Rail sees the potential in the solution, but he's worried about the Halidom refusing to give them sugarcane seeds. Marie cuts him off, explaining that the Halidoms have strict rules about coffee seeds, not sugarcane. She suggests they play hardball in the negotiations, since they're the ones in a pickle. Rail enjoys his chats with Marie, finding them more stimulating than talking to folks who just parrot what others say. He's worried about the possibility of war and the Western Empire taking advantage of the situation to launch an attack. Marie suggests recruiting crusaders to prevent betrayal during a holy war, as the westerners would think twice before turning against them. Rail chuckles and thanks Marie for her brilliant and foolproof suggestions. Despite being hailed as a genius, Rail thinks Marie is the real deal, reminding him of the intelligent and wise Hildegard. Speaking of Hildegard, she was a saint from Germany's Bingen region who had a rare gift of seeing visions from the sky since she was just three years old. Yet, she chose to live a quiet life as a nun, hiding her extraordinary abilities. When she turned 42, she received a divine order to share her visions with the world. She complied, leaving behind a stunning record that left many in awe. She also founded a convent solely for nuns, creating history and earning her the title of Hildegard von Bingen. Back at the palace, word of Marie's idea spread like wildfire, catching the attention of nobles and residents alike. But Marie isn't a fan of the limelight. She knows Prince Rail wouldn't take credit for someone else's idea, but she didn't expect him to openly credit her. As the negotiations with the Eastern delegates wrapped up successfully, the nobles showered Rail with praise. In response, Rail revealed that the idea was actually Marie's. He had promised to reward her if the plan worked, and now he asks her what she wanted. Marie's humble request to be a free person catches Rail off guard. He acknowledges her wish, but feel it's too small a reward for her significant contribution. Instead, he promises to give her a reward beyond her wildest dreams. Marie's mind is spinning with possibilities as she mulls over her upcoming freedom. 
She's looking forward to stepping outside the palace walls and breathing in the fresh air of independence. But, there's a pang of guilt that nags at her. Rail has been her rock since she arrived at the palace, and it feels wrong to just up and leave without saying goodbye. She decides to pen him a thank you note, a small token of her gratitude. A few days later, Gilbert, the ever formal servant, finds Marie and hands her a scroll. He tells her it's a reward from the prince himself. The scroll declares her free from her prisoner of war status. Marie can't believe it, is she finally free? But Gilbert quickly bursts her bubble. There's more to it than meets the eye, he warns. The next day, Rail shocks Marie with an unexpected honor. He knights her, bestowing upon her a title and a distinguished surname Hilderun. Marie von Hilderun, as she's now known, is taken aback. She had wanted a simple life, but Rail has other plans. He urges her to serve God and the people with kindness, just like Saint Hildegard. Marie is torn between gratitude and frustration. She should be afraid of Rail, despise him even, but she can't. The palace staff, including Jane, Ecolin, and Lesia, are thrilled for her. Despite her new title, Marie continues her maid duties, now exclusively for the prince. This changes the palace dynamics, especially with Rachel. Rachel congratulates Marie on her new title when they bump into each other in the hallway. It's a weird moment for both of them. Their original plan has gone awry, and Marie's new rank means leaving the palace won't be easy if Rachel becomes the crown princess. Marie resolves to find another way out rather than wallow in worry. Later, Marie runs into Orlin, the prince's right-hand man. He jokingly asks if he should call her Madame Hilderun or just Marie. She tells him to stick with Marie. Orlin comes off as a jolly fellow, but Marie knows better. His wartime nickname was Bloodhound, hinting at a ruthless side beneath his jovial exterior. He asks her where she's headed, and she tells him the prince sent her on an errand. She wonders if he's looking for her, but he laughs it off, saying he was just saying hi. But as Marie walks away, she can feel Orlin's suspicious gaze on her back. Orlin is intrigued by Marie. Her story of being an orphan knight's daughter turned maid is all too familiar. But something doesn't add up. Her talents are too remarkable for a common maid, and nobody in Clowen seems to know anything about her. It reminds him of Princess Marina. He can't shake off the feeling that there's more to Marie than meets the eye. Over in the grandeur of the Western Empire Palace, a mysterious figure is giving Johannes the lowdown on their latest scheme. The plan to turn the Halidom against the Eastern Empire? Yeah, that one's gone belly up. Despite their attempts to grease some palms around the Sultan, it didn't pan out. Turns out, the Crown Prince was more adaptable than they'd expected. But Johannes isn't sweating it. He thinks the East's new sugar production could work in their favor, making an alliance with the West more likely. Johannes then switches gears and starts musing about Rachel. He's got a hunch she's playing for his team. If she ends up as the Crown Princess, their job would be a whole lot easier. His thoughts then drift to Princess Marina. He's due to head east soon and wants to track her down beforehand. His mystery informant seems confident they'll find her soon, and then moves on to talk about Marie. Turns out, Marie's the one who threw a wrench in their plans. Johannes kicks himself for not bringing her back when he had the chance. His informant tried to dig up some dirt on her but came up empty-handed. Johannes is taken aback, how could that be possible? That's when it hits him, could Marie be Marina? Intrigued, he tells his chancellor to keep a close eye on Marie. This is turning into quite a fascinating puzzle. The next morning, Gilbert drops by with some news, Marie will be hitting the road with the prince. Marie wonders if any of the princess candidates will be tagging along, but Gilbert tells her no. The prince doesn't want to burden the southwest region with an unnecessary entourage, though they will have a guard for security. Later, Marie finds herself at the carriage prep area, ready for the trip. She spots Almond and Rail, who's not wearing his mask. Recognizing him as Ran, she bounds over to greet him. The knights, including Almond, are baffled by her behavior. Marie starts going on about her new title, but Almond cuts her off, pointing at Rail and revealing he's the crown prince. Marie's mind goes blank. She can't process what she's hearing, so Almond repeats himself. Rail begins to apologize for deceiving her, 
but Marie isn't listening. Her brain is trying to reconcile Rand with the Crown Prince. As they journey to the Southwest region, Marie can't help but wonder why Rail never told her who he was. She steals glances at him, marveling at his good looks. He really is as handsome as the rumors say. Rail interrupts her daydreaming, asking if the ride is too rough. Marie apologizes, explaining that she didn't recognize him at the festival and ended up disrespecting him. But Rail brushes it off, telling her it's okay. The close quarters of the carriage make Marie realize just how close Rail is to her. She wishes he would take a break from his work and rest. Rail insists that she should rest until they reach their destination. Curious, Marie asks why Rail always wears a mask when his face doesn't have any significant scars. She's heard the rumors but never thought much of them until now. She wonders if she should just ask him outright, but before she can, the carriage lurches violently. Marie's world spins as she tumbles onto rail, papers scattering all around them. She opens her eyes to find herself sprawled on top of the prince, who's looking at her with a mix of surprise and concern. Flustered, Marie scrambles off him, mumbling apologies. Back at the palace, the maid brigade is deep into their daily gossip session. With Marie gone, they've shifted their focus to speculating about the prince's possible feelings for her. Some are convinced that the trip will bring them closer together, while others are skeptical, pointing out the prince's apparent indifference towards his current princess candidates. Lesia, ever the voice of reason, wonders if the prince will choose anyone at all. In a carriage, Marie is mortified by her clumsiness. She can't believe she fell on the prince, not once, but twice. Rail, meanwhile, is trying to keep his cool. He assures Marie he's fine and starts gathering his papers. Marie lends a hand, all the while avoiding eye contact. As they continue their journey, Rail steals glances at Marie, wondering if he's losing his mind and regretting his decision to bring her along. Upon reaching the southwest region, Rail steps out of the carriage and stretches his stiff shoulders. Marie asks if he's okay, and while he's tempted to tell her the truth that her presence is making him jittery, he brushes it off. Amon suggests they set up camp for the night, catching Rail off guard. He hadn't considered the possibility of sleeping outside and immediately worries about Marie's comfort. He instructs Amon to prepare a bed that's as cozy, warm, and fluffy as the ones in the Imperial Palace, much to Amon's surprise. Later, Rail offers the prepared bed to Marie. She hesitates, but he assures her he's not a fan of fluffy beds. Marie finds this odd, knowing that Rail is usually very particular about his sleeping arrangements due to his insomnia. Before she can say anything, Rail walks away, leaving Marie alone with her thoughts. As Marie lies under the starry sky, she reflects on Rail's actions. His disregard for social status and his caring nature make him a great leader. She begins to wonder if there's a way for her to stay by his side. Meanwhile, Rail watches Marie from a distance. He moves closer and gently covers her with a blanket. He's troubled by his feelings for Marie. He can't stop thinking about her, no matter how hard he tries. He considers keeping her close, but he's interrupted by Amund. Amund advises Rail not to suppress his feelings, warning that he might regret it later. Rail wonders if Amund is speaking from personal experience, and Amund admits that he has made mistakes in the past. He doesn't want Rail to end up like him, full of regret. Rail gives Amund a resolute nod, admitting that he can't keep up this emotional tug of war. He's all in for the Empire, and everything else, feelings included, comes second. As he gets up to leave, Amund offers to tag along, but Rail brushes off his offer. He knows these parts like the back of his hand and promises to be back soon. Amund watches him go, reminding him not to overdo it. Meanwhile, Marie is deep in dreamland, where she's an audience to an emperor lauding a chef for a mouth-watering cake. The emperor can't hold back his curiosity about the chef's secret recipe. The chef humbly credits his time in the slums for his culinary prowess. Waking up from this foodie fantasy, Marie feels a bit woozy and decides to shake it off with a walk. When Amund asks where she's headed, she just shrugs and asks if it's safe. Amund points out a nearby path frequented by locals but warns her not to wander too far. As Marie strolls, she spots a familiar figure up ahead, Rail. Intrigued, she trails behind him, curious about his destination. They end up at a cemetery nestled in a ruined village. Marie watches Rail, wondering what's going through his mind as he gazes at the graves. 
Then, out of the blue, Rail breaks the silence. He tells her they're heading to Vale Castle next, where they'll stay the night before checking out the potential sugarcane plantation site. Marie questions why Rail himself is inspecting the site, instead of sending an inspector. But Rail insists it's too important to delegate. He explains that successful sugarcane farming could change the game for the whole empire and bring hope to the struggling folks in the southwest. Marie is touched by Rail's genuine care for his people. Rail then thanks Marie, confessing that the sugarcane idea was hers. He admits he'd been thinking of trading with the Halidom but never considered using sugarcane seeds. He believes that Marie's idea could be the beacon of hope the Southwest needs. Rail shares his grand vision of turning the region into a thriving trade hub, attracting merchants from the Hansa League in Northern Europe. Marie can see the spark in his eyes as he talks about his ambitious plans. When they reach Vale Castle, Viscount Gibral and his maids welcome them warmly. Gibral suggests Rail rest and have a meal, but Rail wants to hear the reports first while he eats. As he tucks into his food, Jaibo paints a grim picture of the castle's condition. Rail appreciates his honesty, saying he'd have been offended if Jaibro had spent resources on lavish meals instead of feeding his people. Jaibro then drops a bombshell, the people of the southwest are against the sugarcane plantation. Their resentment towards Rail, rooted in his invasion during the civil war, is too strong. Marie is taken aback by this rebellion news, but Rail seems unfazed. Jaibo goes on to explain that the locals aren't just opposed to the sugarcane plantation, they're against anything tied to rail. This has created a major roadblock in terms of manpower. It's not like they can draft people into service, rail won't hear of it. He believes in respecting the people's freedom and isn't a fan of forced labor. So, what now? Rail decides to take a walk in the town to get a feel for the situation himself. As they stroll through the streets, Marie catches snippets of conversation about sugarcane. One guy admits he's clueless about it, while another chimes in, describing it as a fancy sweet treat that only the rich enjoy. They're convinced that the sugarcane project is just another way for the nobles to line their pockets while they continue to eke out a living. The men don't hold back their resentment towards Rail, painting him as a heartless tyrant responsible for the region's famine. Almond's temper flares, and he's ready to give them a piece of his mind. But Rail holds him back, telling him to let it go. He's heard enough and suggests they head back to the castle. Once there, they'll regroup tomorrow and brainstorm ways to tackle the manpower issue. Marie can't help but worry about Rail. Does he really not care about the nasty things people are saying about him? How can she help him turn things around? She gazes at the sky, hoping for some divine intervention. Later that night, Marie has another dream. This time, she sees a poor boy gazing longingly at a cake through a window. He fantasizes about turning precious sugar into something magical, becoming a master pastry chef. In a dream, the boy, now the renowned chef from her previous dream, announces that he chose to be a patissier because sugar brings joy. The drama is now getting to its peak. Want us to continue? Comment rail below. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, ciao!